the Senate Committee on Finance. We'd like to acknowledge our members present. Uh, we have with us Minority Leader Frank Gillon, our Vice Chairs, Senator Joel Villanueva and Senator Amy Marcos, Vice Chairs Villanueva and Marcos. Uh, I don't see anyone for the moment, but I expect some to attend. And of course, we have with us the Ineda family, headed by the Secretary, Secretary Carl Chua. Uh, and uh, I see some other people here, Marilu Mendoza, Josefina Almeida. I think the head of PID, Celia Reyes, is also with us, ma'am. Uh, I see some other names I would like to greet, but uh, the full list is with the committee secretariat. So we'll ask them to please acknowledge the presence of the uh, members of the NEDA family and the attached agencies. Committee Sec, please. We would like to acknowledge uh, the presence of our resource person, uh, Carl, uh, Secretary Carl Kendrick Chua, Yusek Rosemary Edilon, Assistant uh, Yusek Jose Miguel De La Rosa, Dr. Celia M. Reyes, Chairperson Marilu Mendoza, Yusek Claire Dennis Mapa, Executive Director Josefina Venegas Almeda, Executive Director Donald Gawe, Dr. Juan Antonio Perez III. That's all, your, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Comsec. Uh, the slides are ready for the, the presentation of NEDA. Comsec, are the slides ready? Or that's on the part of NEDA? NEDA, yes. Sec Carl, you have your slides ready. Uh, yes, we will be sharing the slides now. So after the presentation of uh, Secretary Carl, we will give the floor to the members, uh, same rules as before. And may we ask, may we, we request of the resource persons to turn on your camera when you are speaking because uh, uh, it's been a request uh, relayed many times by senators that they would like to see the person who is uh, <laughs> addressing the body. So we'll give you the floor, Sec Carl. Good morning, sir. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I am in the NEDA boardroom, so I am joined by the various USEC, ASEC, and directors of the NEDA. So we will be moving the camera later as they speak. And I'm also joined by the various heads of attached agency. So I would like to present briefly the proposed budget of the NEDA family for 2021. Uh, I will just cover four areas, the overview of NEDA, the key accomplishments in 2019 and our expected accomplishments in 2020, and our goals for 2021, which the budget will support, then the proposed budget and the fund utilization to give you an idea of how we are progressing with the last year and the present budget. Uh, the NEDA is a special agency. It is one of, I think, the only agency that is mentioned in the Constitution among the members of cabinet. It comprises, next slide, the NEDA board, which is headed by the president, and the NEDA secretariat, which I head. So these are the two important uh, bodies uh, under the NEDA structure. And uh, the NEDA board, actually, in the next slide, will have uh, six or seven committees the DBCC, as you know, prepares the budget. The ICC evaluates uh, major projects. The Infracom uh, provides the policy on infrastructure. And we also have the various uh, social development, tariff and related matters, regional development, and national land use. So all of these committees are headed by various secretaries and report to the NEDA board chaired by the president. The uh, NEDA secretariat presently is structured uh, with four groups, each of them represented by or headed by a USEC and an ASEC supporting them. And under the groups are the various uh, staff. And uh, because NEDA's mandate is, uh, previous slide, NEDA's mandate is very broad. It actually covers almost everything about the economy and development. Our structure basically mirrors the public service uh, wherein uh, each staff has a mandate to uh, oversee actually the operations of the other departments. And uh, we are, um, uh, we have uh, seven attached agencies. The major ones are the Philippine Statistics Authority, and then we have the research arm, Philippine Statistical Research and Training Institute. Our uh, uh, policy research arm is the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. We also have the Philippine National Volunteer Service Coordination Agency, the Public-Private Partnership Center, the Tariff Commission, and the Commission on Population and Development. So, uh, Mr. Chair, this is the uh, first part of the presentation, an overview of the NEDA family structure. 
Now let me now go to the key accomplishments for 2019 and our expected accomplishments for 2020 and the goals for next year. And I will be uh, presenting this by uh, programs that are reflected in the budget or the national expenditure program. Our first major program is socioeconomic policy and planning uh, program. Uh, the major accomplishments are the following. The first one would be the passage of key reforms. And some of these were uh, directly pushed by NEDA, including the Rice Tarification, Philippine Innovation Act, the UHC, and the Four Peace Act. The second accomplishment is the midterm update of the PDP, which includes now COVID-19 response, and the update of the 15 regional development plans, representing the 15 NEDA regional uh, offices um, uh, coverage. Number three is the preparation of the We Recover as One report. This is uh, our contribution to the COVID uh, new normal um, agenda and the accompanying budget guidelines, which were used actually by the agencies to prepare the 2021 budget submission. Number four is the preparation of the NEDA regional offices COVID-19 rehabilitation and recovery plans. Number five is we are the vice chair of the Balik Provincia Bagong Pag-asa program and we contributed with the uh, preparation of the framework to guide the long-term implementation of this program. And number six would be uh, various policy research uh, such as in uh, labor migration, on the provincial product account, quality of life, and so on. Uh, the next slide basically shows you the uh, revised uh, framework for our uh, Philippine development uh, program and the uh, overarching uh, objectives of Matatag, Maginhawa at Panatag na Buhay have been maintained, but the focus would now be on the uh, health, uh, healthy and resilient Philippines. So if um, you will allow me, Sir Chair, I will not go to the details um, to make the presentation brief. The next slide uh, uh, retains the framework, but uh, shows you the various um, outputs or um, uh, results that we expect to achieve under the pillars of Malasakid, Pagbabago, at Patuloy na Pagunlad. If I may proceed to the next uh, presentation slide, under Program 2, which is on National Investment Programming, uh, the key accomplishments are the preparation of the updated public investment program, the various regional development investment program, and the three-year rolling infrastructure plan, which is basically submitted to DBM to guide the budget process. We have also facilitated the ICC approval of 27 new projects amounting to 770.8 billion. So these are now in the pre-implementation or implementation stage. We are, have worked also with the other departments to update the infrastructure flagship programs to 104, which now includes the COVID response or the new normal projects. And finally, we have uh, worked uh, hard to ensure that uh, the, the Regional Development Council endorsed projects in the budget increases. So we have seen an increase from 4.84% in 2019 to 25% in the 2020 budget. And we continue to monitor these. Uh, next slide. On our third program, which is on national development monitoring and evaluation, we continue to regularly evaluate the IFP or the infrastructure flagship projects to include COVID-19 response and other ready to implement projects. Uh, the infrastructure flagship program is actually an evolving program and every quarter we evaluate to see uh, the progress. We, as mandated by the ODA law, prepare annually the ODA portfolio review and we find an improvement in the utilization rate from 67 to 72%. And under the various uh, regional project monitoring and evaluation system, we have uh, looked into 930 ongoing and completed projects across 15 regions. And uh, this amounted to 898 billion peso worth of projects that we monitor at the regional level. We also prepared the annual socioeconomic report. Uh, and this is input to the budget priorities framework uh, for the budget for this year, and we have conducted uh, eight evaluation studies. Uh, now let me go to our major goals for 2021. For Program 1, our goal basically number one is to continue our economic management towards recovery and resiliency, and we do this through... Can I just flag something, Sec. Carl, sorry to interrupt. 
Could you yes, tell us yes, what yes. are those eight uh, project studies uh, when you're able to, please? You can continue. Uh, sure. Uh, let me get the list and come back in a while. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Okay. Uh, for our goals, uh, number two would be the uh, oversee the implementation of the updated Philippine Development Plan and the regional development plans. Number three is to support the remaining key legislations that were mentioned in various SONAS, including the Foreign Investment Act, Retail Trade Liberalization Act, and the Public Service Act. All three would, are, are needed to further open the economy to create uh, uh, opening for foreign investment, jobs, technology transfer. We also have the Water Sector Reform, the National Land Use Act, and we support the uh, economic team's uh, direction to pass the FIS, the Guide, and the Create as part of the Bayanihan 2 Recovery Program. We continue, number four, to review our national targets and plans to achieve the sustainable development goals. Number five is to coordinate and guide the implementation of the Balik Provincia Bagong Pag-asa or the BP2 program. Number six is to assist in the implementation of the 2022 devolution and provide support to LGU's planning capacity, given the Mandanas case. Number seven is to complete the pending 16 infrastructure master plan and 16 feasibility studies that are ongoing. Uh, number eight is to the conduct of further um, policy studies such as on um, uh, labor migration, quality of life, uh, and uh, ambition not in 2040. And number nine is uh, subject to the budget, uh, formulation of the National Innovative Innovation Agenda for Sustainable Development and to convene the National Innovation Council. Later, I will explain, Mr. Chair, that the budget cuts have prevented us from moving forward with some of these. For Program 2, our goals are basically to update the midterm Philippine uh, Public Investment Program to incorporate the COVID-19 response. We have actually prepared many of these uh, early part of this year, but because of COVID, a lot of these would have to be revisited. We would continue to evaluate the uh, upcoming pipeline projects uh, that are coming to the ICC, and we would conclude the review of the JV guidelines and the proposed amendments to the BOT law or the proposed PPP Act. For Program 3, we would continue to monitor the progress of the priority infrastructure flagship programs and the other build, build, build projects. We will prepare the final socioeconomic report uh, of this administration that will um, basically provide input to the final 2022 budget. And we would continue to conduct uh, various thematic evaluations of government programs. Some of these include those uh, in the water sector, the social safety net for the train law, uh, the blended learning, alternative work arrangement, and the build, build, build program. And to support our objectives, uh, we would have to um, proceed with the review, the institutional review of the NEDA, which includes the NEDA bill, knowledge management, and our change management program. Uh, the NEDA digitalization and IT enhancement and our building renovation. We are staying in a building that is uh, close to 50 years old, so we would have to uh, improve our uh, facilities to be able to help us deliver better. So those are the uh, key accomplishments of the NEDA Office of the Secretary. As for the uh, major accomplishments and goals of the major attached agencies, let me begin with the Philippine Statistics Authority. This year is a census year, so the PSA has started in September, the conduct of the census. And uh, we are uh, on track to pre-register 9 million households uh, individuals and to register 5 million for the national ID and to implement a decentralized copy annotation process. Basically, this is for the availment of the public uh, in a faster manner of their various uh, birth certificates or marriage certificates and so on. For 2021, the objective is to register the next 45 million Filipinos uh, to digitize all the surveys and census and to open 50 new civil registry system outlets so we can serve the people better. This uh, next slide is the uh, roadmap of the FILSIS or the Philippine National ID. Uh, the plan here is uh, was prepared prior to COVID and we endeavor to complete as many of them this year and in the next two years. 
in the fourth quarter of 2020, the objective is to pre-register 9 million and to register at least 5 million. So the main difference, uh, Mr. Chair, is because of COVID, we cannot do mass registration and the capture of biometrics will spread the virus. So we will have to uh, come up with another way to collect the information through house-to-house -house visit, and that is the pre-registration of the 9 million. And after they have been pre-registered, they will be scheduled like an appointment system to visit the registration center so that uh, we would minimize the crowd. And in uh, 2021, the objective is to uh, register 45 million, uh, including the remaining 10 million low-income households that we would like to prioritize so that they can open bank accounts. And in 2022, would be to register the remaining 42 million, uh, five years old and above. And the uh, registration of those who... Uh, in the last mile, those between those who will be uh, entering five years and above would be done uh, in the outer years. The next slide refers to the accomplishments of the Population and Development Commission. Uh, they have provided family planning services to more than 300,000 couples and individuals. Uh, they have uh, reached out to 370,000 adolescents uh, to prevent teenage pregnancy, and they have also developed uh, demographic vulnerability tool to facilitate the pandemic response and strengthen the local database of the LGUs. For 2021, their target is to further expand the responsible parenthood and family planning program to cover 1.5 million beneficiaries. Uh, the second is uh, various strategies to prevent further teenage pregnancy and reduce adolescent birth rate to just 37 births per 1,000 and to implement regional action plans to accelerate the demographic dividends uh, covering 50% of provinces and cities. Uh, I would like to request later USEC uh, GP to elaborate if there are questions. The next slide is for the Public-Private Partnership Center of the Philippines. The key accomplishments would be to add 32 new projects to the PPP pipeline, and they include both national and local projects, including joint ventures. The conduct of 107 capacity building activities for various implementing agencies to prepare, design, and monitor PPP projects, and the adoption of uh, four policy instruments, including those on contingent liability, people initiative, uh, and uh, various codes at the local level. The objectives for 2021 would be to uh, add projects that would cater to the new normal priorities, especially in the health and IT sectors, the monitoring of the fiscal impact of COVID-19 uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic on existing PPP projects, and to improve the PPP process to deliver faster. The next slide would be for the Philippine Institute of Development Studies. They have implemented the third wave impact evaluation of the four piece or the conditional cash transfer program. They have also looked at studies on disease uh, transmission, health system requirements, and macroeconomic impact, and these have been submitted actually to the IATF, uh, the impact of COVID on these, and the conduct of the evaluation of the Universal Access to Quality Tertiary Education Act. And for 2021, they would continue, subject to the budget, to continuously assess the four-piece program to begin the evaluation of other programs, such as in medicine procurement, agriculture, modernization, social pension, and hospital financing, and the conduct on the studies on the digital economy. So those are all aligned for uh, to, to the new normal. For the uh, Tariff Commission, uh, this is basically, um, they have basically issued 804 advanced rulings on various tariff classifications and 20 tariff classification dispute rulings. They have drafted uh, three EOs on tariff modification, uh, including the temporary increase in the uh, oil uh, tariff to support our COVID financing, and the completion of three investigations on safeguard measures. For 2021, they propose to maintain 100%, uh, to uphold 100% the tariff classification rulings sustain 100% approval performance on the recommended policies and tariff and non-tariff measures and issue at least two recommendations on trade remedy measures. On the uh, PSRTI, 
uh, they have conducted uh, various uh, research to support our Philippine statistical development, including the preparation of the CBMS or the community-based monitoring system. And by law, they are mandated to provide the training. For 2021, uh, they continue to conduct methodological research improvement for the various statistics, uh, focusing on agriculture, the sustainable development goals, and capacity building to help the LGUs implement the community-based monitoring system as provided by law. And finally, uh, we have the Philippine National Volunteer Service Coordinating Agency. Uh, they have deployed 261 in and outbound international volunteers to the Philippines for various programs. Uh, they have also advocated volunteerism uh, through their various forums and oriented 305 organizations on how to be a volunteer. And we have tasked them also to provide volunteers for the COVID response. And that would be one of the key priorities for the 2021. So Mr. Chair, with all these uh, accomplishments and our proposed objectives, uh, we are going to propose now the budget that was approved by the president. Uh, but before that, in 2020, NEDA contributed to the COVID response and returned 798 million pesos and these are the breakdowns uh, pursuant to the requirement uh, to realign funds uh, under Bainihan 1 to support our COVID response. So with that uh, we have contributed a lot to the COVID response given our small budget and that would mean uh, we are not able to de deliver everything. For 20 um, for uh, 2021 the uh, total budget that was approved by the um, DBM is uh, 11.171 billion. The bulk of that in the second row would go to the Philippine Statistics Authority, 8.495 billion. And that would uh, fund basically the various statistical programs, including the national ID, which forms a major part of that. The NEDA OSEC, uh, has 1.5 billion down from 1.8 billion uh, this year and the other agencies also would have uh, corresponding uh, budget the the red uh, ones that you see are the decreases uh, between 2020 and 2021 notably for the philippine statistics authority and a big part of that is the budget for the community-based monitoring system, which the DBM did not provide in full. Uh, the NEDA OSEC also had uh, some cuts. Also, the uh, PIDS has a significant cut, and that will impact some of the activities, as will be explained later. In the next slide, um, in the uh, NEDA OSEC, uh, we have been receiving uh, several uh, funds for various uh, studies. Uh, these include the research and development studies, monitoring and evaluation fund, the value engineering, value analysis, project development and other related studies fund, the innovation fund, the fund to provide secretariat services to the National in Innovation Council and for the sustainable, sustainable development goals. We have uh, proposed to the DBM this year, Mr. Chair, 675 million. However, we were only given 86 million to cover a small part of our research and development studies. The Just to clarify, Sec. Carl, this 675 million, is that included in your uh, 1.8 budget? Or oh. it's, it's a separate item? These are separate items. Oh, uh, these uh, particular funds are included in the NEDA budget, but instead of getting 675 as we proposed, we only got 86. Ah, I see, I see, okay. And um, of course, uh, we understand the uh, difficulty of getting the full budget because of we had to reprioritize uh, from regular spending to COVID response. But this is just to show the committee, Mr. Chair, that uh, there will be uh, some areas of our mandate that we cannot implement, in particular, uh, Republic Act 11.293 or the Innovation Fund, for instance. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. Was that one of the discontinued 440 million, the innovation? Because that was a Senate insertion. Uh, it, was, um, it was included in the 2020 uh, budget. That's right. But uh, it had to be returned to the... In full. Uh, it was returned in full? In full. Yes, in full this year. 
And for next year, we propose 300 million. Uh, it was not provided by the DBM. Again, because of the reprioritization towards the COVID response. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, if I may uh, conclude. Please, um, please, yeah. The final two slides just present the fund utilization for 2019 and 2020. Next slide. Um, for 2019, uh, the relevant columns would be the ones uh, highlighted in yellow. Uh, in general, except for the PSA, uh, NEDA has been, um, the NEDA family has been able to utilize the budget that was provided. What happened in the PSA is that there were some uh, slippage, but uh, this money that this 2.2 uh, billion that was not um, obligated in 2019 was actually obligated in early 2020 so uh, this is just to show that um, uh, there is some delay but we have uh, worked on that and and have spent that money in early 2020 and the next slide shows you that as of the first uh, half of 2020 our obligation to allotment rate uh, for most of the agencies are uh, below the 50% uh, because uh, we basically had to pause for around two or three months during the second quarter for the uh, COVID response, uh, oh, sorry, for the ECQ that limited our delivery. For the PSA, uh, the low amount there, 18%, reflects the fact that the census was originally supposed to be planned for May, had to be moved to September because we couldn't go out in May to do the census during the height of the ECQ. But the PSA has started the census operation in September. Uh, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, it ends my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary Carl. Any others from the attached agencies or that, that's, that covers everyone? Mr. Chair, uh, a while ago you asked for the eight uh, studies, eight evaluation studies. Yes. So um, they include, number one, the assessment of the anti-red tape or the ARTA. The second one is the assessment of the nutrition program. And the third one is the evaluation of the uh, payapa, uh, payapa at Masaganang Pamayanan or the Pamana program. And then there are five more. Uh, the fourth one is the Rural Road Network Development Project. Then the next one is the Light Rail Transit. The next one is the Agrarian Reform Infrastructure Support. And then the Agri Pinoy Livestock Program and the uh, evaluation of uh, several uh, local road programs. So these are the eight ones that were included in the uh, evaluation studies. Thank you. Yeah. Before I turn it over to my colleagues, uh, Sec Carl, could you furnish us with copies of those studies? Uh, uh, yes, please. please. Yes, I and uh, just, just one point before I turn it over. Of the 440 million you were asked to return uh, pursuant to the Bayanihan realignment, you you said 300 was already returned. That's the innovation fund inserted by the Senate. Uh, what was the other 140 million, Sec? Uh, sorry, the amount that we returned, um, oh, sorry, for NEDA OSEC. Well, yes, uh, for NEDA -OSEC. We, had to, we had to return various small items. Uh, we were not allowed to travel, to hire, job. Oh, MOE. Order. MOE. MOE, yes, yes, yes. There's a standard 10% that we have to return according to the budget circular. Okay, so the order is, uh, I'll turn it over now to my colleagues, uh, Vice Chair Marcos, then Vice Chair Villanueva, then Minority Leader Drillon. Vice Chair Marcos, go ahead, you have 10 minutes. Yes, thank you very much, um, uh, Secretary Carl. Perhaps we can be provided with the updated list of the 104 infrastructure flagship projects, the IFP, as well as the new normal projects approved by NEDA. Um, would you have those or have they been submitted to the Committee on Finance and my Chairman Angara? Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Chair, it is submitted. Uh, in fact, it is publicly available now in the NEDA website. The link yes, is um, actually, there's a level of confusion eh, with the website. Um, can I just have them sent na lang through the uh, committee? Kung pwede? Yes, yes, we will send the table. Uh, yeah, also with the indulgence of Vice Chair Marcos, could you add the 32 projects in the pipeline of the PPP? I'd like to speak. Yes. 
Yes. Sure, we will send that 30 to Thank you. Department. Thank you, Sec. Go ahead, ma'am. Yes, so that uh, we can have a, a fair assessment. I'm also uh, quite concerned about the national evaluation policy framework. Um, as we know, time and again, uh, there's been an issue about monitoring and evaluating uh, projects, uh, which is, in fact, a uh, NED uh, uh, objective as well. Uh, how far along are we with this? As um, I think uh, we've been repeating told by the UNDP that we need to get uh, uh, more uh, more active in this regard and uh, how can we help you with this because uh, it's so important now that we're struggling with so many uh, requests for funding and so many projects that need to fall by the wayside uh, th th thank you uh, Mr. Chair uh, Senator Aimee uh, that's a very important uh, question. In fact, I discussed this with the NEDA family. And uh, there are many programs that we have in government, and we need to evaluate them. There are two constraints. One is funding. Uh, we are being supported by the budget, uh, GNDP, and other development partners. Right. The, our second concern really is the very limited skills in the country to do a proper evaluation. And some of them require highly statistical uh, training like uh, randomized control trials. That is why uh, we are we we also have to have a bigger budget in some way to attract uh, the talents which are not found in the Philippines. Uh, but um, we are discussing yeah, now. So and, I, I, I uh, think. Uh, yes. Uh, I think that uh, in terms of statisticians, ang dami naman natin yan, there's a great deal also of software that can be utilized for this sort of thing. And uh, once again, marami rin tayong talent. So uh, um, are we actively hiring or uh, uh, napipigilan tayo ng ating PS and MOE constraints? Uh, well, uh, part of that, ma'am, is the budget. But uh, oh. to do a, an evaluation, po kasi, uh, there are many ways to do it. One is process evaluation that we can do, sure. uh, and the simple one. But for the more sophisticated one, like randomized control trials, is a very is a very new field actually. That's right. So not, yes. not many would know that, and we would have to hire uh, foreign experts uh, in many cases. Yes, but um, if if uh, that's the case, kasi yung randomized nga, yan nga yung uso ngayon, with all the Nobel laureates uh, all espousing the same, with Banerjee and the rest uh, completely dependent on that. Eh, pero like you said nga, you have to embark upon it as a special project because uh, it's a whole new field. Um, are you suggesting you need to outsource that na lang? Uh, actually, most of the projects are being outsourced. Uh, we cannot in do all, uh, although we do monitor uh, ourselves uh, some, but we have to outsource many of these projects, uh, evaluation projects. Yes. Um, are there are there any suggestions? How do we get a uh, handle on that? Because budget tayo ng budget, uh, collecta ng collecta, pero natatapon lang yung pera ng madalas. So uh, what can we immediately do aside from funding? Although perhaps the chairman can find ways and means to up that uh, item also. Uh, Ma'am, I was uh, told in the past there was an effort by NEDA and DBM to agree on what are the priority programs to evaluate to inform the budget. Unfortunately, with the change of administration, that did not uh, happen. So that is one thing that uh, we intend to pursue. The second one is uh, we have many agencies getting various funds for small evaluation. Uh, NEDA also and the PIDS. So we are proposing, actually, I talked to my execom to uh, yes. have one list lang for the entire government so we can prioritize ano ba gusto natin. For instance, Senator Nancy mentioned that we need to evaluate the livelihood programs. So there are also yes. those that, uh, so I think we have to organize ourselves, uh, get adequate funds uh, based on the priority that we want. Yes, that, uh, I absolutely agree. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thinking actually that there should be an assessment of all the anti-poverty efforts. We are spending so much with the four Ps. We've been spending non-stop since uh, 2007, 2012. Dagdag tayo ng dagdag dyan. Ano ba talaga ang uh, impact assessment ng lahat na yan? At uh, watak-watak sila na sa DOLE, DSWD. They're all over the place eh. Kaya nga, well, with the uh, indulgence of uh, Vice Chair Marcos, Sec Carl mentioned earlier the pending assessment, you said, and you want to continue it of yes. the four Ps. Yes, actually, the PI, uh, the biggest bulk of the PIDS research budget is the regular assessment of the four Ps. Yeah. And could you give us those, uh, could you give us the whatever you have on that end? 
Uh, yes, uh, I will request uh, Celia Reyes to provide copies of those completed studies. Yes, actually, tama yung chair eh. Kasi parang yung nakita ko, miskin sa PIDS, parang regular assessment lang siya eh. Hindi siya mukhang external audit, kumbaga sa korporasyon. Yung right. parang yung internal audit eh. Nandun pa rin tayo sa mentalidad na okay yung project, sige-sige lang. So, dapat yata mag-overhaul. I think we need to diversify the 4P offerings. Kasi although it has helped with health, vaccination, as well as educational at the elementary level, it really hasn't uh, given us a significant uh, uh, change or uh, reduction in poverty except for short-term poverty lang. Kaya sana, uh, tutukan po natin yan. And I would be very supportive, uh, uh, Secretary Carl, of any kind of uh, um, uh, recommendation to uh, strengthen and broaden the national evaluation policy framework. Po. And uh, I think uh, the other thing is the ODA. No? I think we've significantly improved uh, over the decades the utilization rate of ODA, uh, increasing it to about 70% on average yata ngayon. Pero it's still low. And that's been there for several years. Di ba natin talaga ma-improve ito? Um, Yusuf John, would you like to help? Okay. May, may I request Yusuf John yes. to contribute? Sure, sure. Uh, actually, with uh, with uh, ODA, uh, first and foremost, po, uh, we'd like to inform you that as uh, already indicated by Secretary Chua, we have been moving forward to less reliance on ODA because we were expecting to move up to the upper middle income status. In that context, the improvement po ng, ano, ng ODA uh, has come about with a combination not just of the NEDA function for monitoring and evaluation, but also the reforms in the budget. budget uh, the cash-based uh, budget actually helped in maintaining discipline. But the essential problem, po, uh, Your Honours, is that the preparation of these projects also require institutional capacity of the agencies to mobil mobilize themselves effectively. So may we also look into this in terms of supporting the agencies, uh, Secretary Carl, uh, in terms of the project planning and project management. This is the other half now. As we move towards upper middle income uh, country status, it is expected po, that we will not be eligible that much anymore for ODA. And therefore, we have to do our own improvements for ourselves in terms of project preparation, project planning, project management and contract administration. Uh, I'd like to leave, to leave that uh, at that point, Secretary Carl, if I may, Your Honours. Uh, with the indulgence of, you're on mute, uh, Vice Chair Aimee. Uh, Sec Carl, maybe you could just give us a rundown of, uh, not now, but uh, uh -uh. What steps, given what uh, Yusek John mentioned, that we have to uh, lessen reliance on ODA. Well, how do we transition uh, to uh, out of that uh, mold because we have so many projects out of from ODA, especially from Japan. Yeah, just, just, just not now, but uh, just give us a maybe a one pager on that. Oh. Thank you. Mr. And then also, and that also in addition to what the chairman requested, if we can uh, inquire also from USEC and Secretary Carl, um, which institutions in particular, yung malalaki talaga that we really need to beef up para. Para magawa ng paraan at uh, mas maganda yung utilization rate. I think DOTR definitely needs oh, to definitely. be. Oh, definitely. Yung paborito na. Definitely. That's Senate. very poor uh, utilization. No? That's right. For sure yung mga DOTR. Pero siguro kung pwede ninyo kami uh, bigyan rin ng breakdown yan so that uh, we can also help uh, push the effort. Yun lang po, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Ah, Ms. okay. Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. Mr. Yeah, yeah. Chair, Go ahead. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, if I may just go back to the to the issue of uh, the evaluation, actually because of RA one one three one zero, PIDS has to set up now formally an evaluation unit on the four piece because we're mandated to come up with recommendations right. every three years. Um, right. as what the Senate center marcus uh, mentioned and in terms of capacity fortunately we've been working on the evaluation of the four piece with the international um, development partners so we've worked with them um, for the first wave second wave and third wave 
uh, some of our fellows and PIDS actually did the data analysis for the third wave. So uh, we have some expertise even with regards to randomized control trials. And so um, I, I think it's really as what uh, Ned, Ned, the Secretary Chua mentioned, uh, we need some resources to be able to, to do this. We also did training for the other government agencies for evaluation, impact evaluation. And I think this is something that PIDS needs to do again for, for the other agencies. Uh, and we have lined up for this year um, and also for next year, several uh, programs to be evaluated. Thank you, sir. Ma'am, when is that three-year period to submit? Uh, when is that coming up? That's uh, 2023? 2022. 2022. Because what, the what law, month? Um, Usually. It doesn't say the month. Three years yeah. after the passage of the bill, which was okay. 2019. So, in fact, we're a bit concerned about that. Thank you. Why? You, you've not done anything with respect to that yet? You, you've no, not done the spade work for that? We have proposed... Uh, uh, projects in relation to this, but they were not all going to be funded uh, next year. Okay, thank you. So we all have right. Vice Chair Vision Nueva is the next to ask questions to be followed by Minority Leader Frank Drillon. Go ahead. And Senator Recht is also here, I believe. He, I was told he's also joining us. He's after the Minority Leader. Go ahead, Vice Chair Joel. Vision thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, to our resource uh, persons uh, uh, who are joining us this morning. Um, let me also state for the record, Mr. Chairman, that uh, our office uh, is, uh, is interested also with the uh, request uh, made by Senator Marcos and with the Chairman's request uh, to have a copy of those you will furnish, Your Honor, you will furnish. projects and the flagship programs. Anyway, Mr. Chairman, to, to go straight to my uh, concerns, I was listening attentively to the... Uh, may I interrupt, Joel? You're yes. an echo. You're an echo. It's difficult to understand what you're saying. If you can, maybe there's so many microphones open. Yeah. I will try to use the microphone here. Topo, Mr. Chair, do you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Okay. Well, uh, I will uh, start by... by uh, saying that I was listening attentively to the uh, uh, presentation by the uh, Secretary of NEDA, and we are actually glad, uh, Secretary Chua, that you are uh, on the hem of NEDA. Our budget for fiscal 2021 is crucial in defining uh, the country's post-disaster landscape. And we have seen how innovations uh, provide hope, especially for uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises amidst this uh, pandemic. And uh, you made mention a while ago of the uh, original uh, proposal of NEDA, the budget of 300 million for the establishment of innovation fund pursuant to Section 21 of the Philippine Innovation Act. Uh, isa ho tayo sa principal author niyan and I can see the uh, frustration of our chairman kanina when you made mention about it. And I also noticed, it's not only that, no? You also propose 17.18 million for the provision of secretariat services. And uh, these uh, two items were, uh, uh, they were not approved by the DBM, no? Um, I, I wonder why, and uh, I just wanted to, to find out kung, kung pinaglaban niyo man lang ito, Secretary, because we feel that this is very important, especially at this time. Uh, you're on mute, Sec. Carl. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Joel. Uh, the NEDA kasi sits in... Oh, I have an echo. Uh, hello? Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. Um, the NEDA, we, we are, of course, an agency mandated to deliver certain uh, mandates like the Innovation Fund Management. We are also uh, in the Development Budget Coordination Committee, which basically looks at the macro and fiscal and set the targets. So uh, in that way, we are doing a very difficult balancing act. We actually propose 
for two years already, the 300 million. Uh, unfortunately, for this year, we had to return it because of the COVID. And for next year, uh, we actually proposed almost double, uh, but the DBM had to um, uh, prioritize. Uh, so this is where we are right now. So I understand actually both sides. We have uh, fought for it, but uh, NEDA is also not looking only at certain um, funds or projects, uh, but also the entire economy. So this is where we are now. Thank you. Like Joel, you're on mute, uh, Vice Chair Joel. Yeah. That's actually my point, Secretary, you know, because in the appropriation uh, for the establishment of innovation fund uh, for this year was discontinued also under the uh, for re later release, no? Um, and perhaps that's the main reason why DBM uh, uh, did not allow or did not approve of this uh, two particular item but let, let me just point out and spread this into the records because we hope that uh, the government can find a way to uh, to tap resources to fund ra 11293 uh, because as many experts have uh, claimed now is the best time for innovation uh, and let me enumerate some of the lord worthy all filipino COVID innovations and inventions at ito po ay uh, kinumpile din ng Esquire Philippines. For example, yung Project Greengrass, which provides an online community monitoring to help LGU enforce quarantine measures. Another is Sakai's Frontliner Commuting Guide, which guides commuters, especially frontliners, on the routes and schedules of P2P buses and public shuttles amidst the lack of public transportation. And last but not least, I will just mention Yung education that PH Online uh, Education Network, which is the largest online platform that provides uh, educational counseling services to stakeholders in senior high schools, higher education institutions, tech book institutions, and also helps them migrate to online learning. So again, uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, we hope that the uh, Secretary of uh, NEDA would would uh, strongly recommend. And uh, I think we have senators here who are more than willing to, to, to help you na ma-raise itong fund na ito because we feel that at this point in time, this is very uh, important. And last but not the least, let me point out, uh, that's why I'm very passionate about this because the Philippine Innovation Act complements our uh, proposed digital workforce competitiveness bill. It's already in the plenary right now which this representation together with the chairperson of, of the Committee on Finance uh, is uh, pushing that seeks to provide the necessary digital infrastructure to upskill and uh, cross-skill the Filipino workforce on digital technology and innovation. So I hope mapondua natin to. I mean, I would rather support this than yung, yung sa DNR's uh, uh, Dolomite White Sand, no? uh, as, as, as reported, 349 million, mas malaki pa kesa dito. I think this is very important. I hope that the Secretary would uh, 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 would have the extra effort because you have you have senators here who can uh, help you with this uh, particular funding. Secretary? I think you're on mute, Sec. Thank you, Senator. Uh, in in fact, we we have uh, requested it uh, several times now, and we would be uh, guided by the wisdom of Congress now that the president has passed the budget to to see where the priorities would be. Thank you. Uh, we're here to help, uh, Secretary. Please, uh, uh, siguro formalize a letter or something so we can uh, help you with the funding. Uh, number two, Mr. President, uh, I'd like to, to, to ask Secretary on the uh, uh, implementation of the national ID system. I was uh, listening attentively to your uh, uh, presentation a while ago. And if I recall last June, uh, the national statistician of uh, PSA, uh, PSA Claire uh, Dennis Mapa, shared that the agency targets uh, to register at least uh, 5 million poor families. And I think you mentioned that a while ago. No? Uh, and, the, and the target is uh, for, for the last quarter of this year. Just to clarify, uh, Mr. Secretary, 
what are the uh, social demographic characteristics of this uh, uh, priority families because I, I I take note of the DSWD uh, uh, four piece no yung pantawid pam pamilya Filipino program uh, they are only set to support 4.4 million so how is this different from the DSWD they're targeting uh, uh, 5 million for, uh, for families um, Mr. Chair, um, let me answer quickly and request Yusek Dennis, who is with us, to give the details. Uh, basically, we know that we have around 18 million low-income families, and that was the coverage of the social amelioration program. Of the 18 million, uh, around 4.2 million are for peace or CCT beneficiaries, and the rest are not. And uh, the CCT beneficiaries during the SAP, mabilis yung pagbigay ng uh, subsidy kasi through their accounts. Nahirapan po yung DSWD sa, sa balance. Uh, that is why the priority of the uh, first uh, few beneficiaries of the national ID are the low incomes without bank accounts. So that uh, in case we need to support them later on, matulungan po sila. May, may I request you, Sek Dennis, for the details? Sige. Uh, before... Uh... Uh, you clear. You may mention 4.2 million. Uh, I think it's 4.4 million in the DSW. Uh, sorry. Um, there are uh, yes. Uh, there are more, but uh, around 4.2 million would have the bank okay. accounts. Yes. Okay. The rest are our GDA areas. Yeah. Can I clarify, Tech Carl, and with the indulgence of our vice chair, uh, San Joel, and before we recognize PSA Yusek uh, Mapa. We, we, when you say 4.4 million poor families, that is the both the CCT and the UCT because we have this uh, under the train law. We came up with the UCT, diba, to cushion the impact on the lower income. Uh, uh, that was, I think, your design, Sec Card, if I'm not mistaken. No? So, yes, um, yeah, could you clarify? Please? Clarify. Um, there are 18 million low income families working in informal sector. Uh, of which around 4.3, 4.4 million are CCT beneficiaries. Uh, to be CCT beneficiaries, they must have mothers and children because that is what we are trying to incentivize, the health and education. Uh, there are other poor and low income not covered by the CCT. In the train law, what we did was to cover the, low, the poorest 10 million. So those are the difference. So how does that overlap? Could you clarify? Because one is uh, 10 million is families, diba? Ano yung sa train? Is that 10 million families or individuals? Families also. Okay, uh, so there's uh, families. Uh, because okay. we, uh, when we uh, give support, it's usually by families. Uh, may I request Yusek Dennis to yes. provide details? Okay. Thank you. Sige, sige. Please, please, Yusek Dennis. Okay, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Senator Joel. Now, uh, for uh, the uh, uh, query of Senator Joel on the demographics of this uh, initial 5 million that will be registered uh, in the national ID for the last quarter of 2020, yung uh, ginamit po namin na source dito ay yung listahan ng tree ng DSWD. Kasi mayroon silang mga uh, pamilya na na-cover na nila sa listahanan. So nakakuha po yung Philippine Statistics Authority ng 9 million households uh, dito sa listahanan 3. The entire uh, list is about 16 million, but uh, we are starting with the 9 million. And uh, we identified, of course, uh, because of the COVID, uh, yung 9 million ay uh, nationwide, but for our operation, just for the last quarter of 2020, we will start with 32 provinces po. Uh, these are the provinces that are identified to have low cases of COVID uh, because, of course, we want to protect the registrant at the same time, our registration officers. So, uh, ito po yung sinabi ni Secretary Carl that we will do a house-to-house to, -house to conduct first the pre-registration to collect the uh, uh, demographic information, uh, which are the 10 information uh, in the national ID. And then uh, we will uh, set an appointment system so that the registrant will be uh, going into our mobile registration centers uh, on a specific day and a specific hour. This is to uh, minimize crowding, queuing, and at the same time, uh, lessen the time spent in the registration center. Kasi ang kukunin na lang natin pag pumunta sila sa registration center ay yung tatlong sets of biometric, the uh, fingerprints, the iris scan, and the photograph. So we, uh, okay. uh, our time and motion, mga 10 minutes lang po or less. 
How many okay. registration centers do we have? Uh, sa ngayon po, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, sa 32 provinces, 655 registration centers. Sa LGU po yan, para hindi na mahirapan yung mga uh, registrants to visit the registration centers. 600 registration centers? 655 po. 600 and they are all contained within LGUs, you said? Yes po, yes. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, go ahead, sir. You're on track uh, with, with regard to your target. Again, uh, you look at the budget implementation of uh, national ID system uh, utilization, uh, medyo hindi pa rin uh, substantial. No? And, and the fact that the, the proposed 4.1 billion budget for the national ID system uh, for 2021 is lower than the requirement uh, targeted na 5.9 billion uh, how it will uh, affect the uh, loss implementation uh, thank you very much senator joel um yung uh, una muna yung sinabi ni secretary Carl kanina yung mga uh, utilization rate no sa 2020 uh, 2019 Ito po ay uh, dahil nagkaroon tayo ng delay sa pag-procure ng mga big IT component ng National ID. Pero na-procure na po namin lahat yan. So lahat ng mga components ay, ay procured na. That's why we are ready uh, to start the uh, uh, registration this October po. No? Yung pre-registration natin, okay. ang kick-off date namin, October 12. Sige, Yusek, at least uh, you're guaranteeing that it will not uh, affect the implementation. Yes po. Okay. Thank you. Let me go to my last point, uh, Mr. Chairman. No? Uh, we have been talking, uh, you said, I mean, uh, Secretary Carl, of the uh, idea of uh, establishing or creating a new department, specifically the Department of Overseas uh, Filipino Workers. In fact, uh, several agencies have uh, given our uh, committee here in the Senate of their uh, position, although Vague po lahat eh. um, They are in support in principle, but uh, for example, Dole would say uh, they are in support, but uh, they are requesting the POEA, OWA, and NRCO be retained uh, to provide seamless uh, transactions. Um, DFA, ganun din, in principle. Um, we have been writing a letter to NEDA, Secretary Carl, and uh, if you recall, I had a very... Uh, disappointing uh, relationship with NEDA for the past two, three years. Um, let me be specific. Yung uh, security of tenure, we have been inviting them several times. They would not appear. They would not uh, say anything. And then all of a sudden, they would issue a public statement for the president to veto the measure. Ang sakit-sakit ho. Now, we are given uh, a, a proposed uh, bill, administration bill by PLLO. And again, we have been writing letters uh, to different agencies of the government, especially NEDA. And as of now, we have yet to receive anything from uh, uh, the department. So may, may I know, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Secretary, kung ano ho yung stand ninyo? Because if I recall, and please correct me if, I, if I'm wrong, you made a statement and raised... Uh, concerns over the creation of uh, of uh, Department of OFW and specifically you said you want to prioritize right sizing before the creation of a new department and you prefer an interagency council composed of competent bodies to strengthen assistance to OFWs and migrants. May I know if this is still your stand or because a lot of uh, government agencies have had a change of heart especially after the sauna of the president. And we are here to help. I mean, I, I, I'm ready to, to hear the measure. And actually, may mga nagsasabi na, na pinipigil ko daw. I'm not because I, I, I'm ready to hear it. It's just that I'm, 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 I've been waiting for the, for the position of uh, the different government agencies. Para hindi naman pagdating sa committee hearing, eh, lahat po eh, nagbabanggaan lang din. Ho, no? So I, I, I hope I can uh, have a clear... Um, a statement and position uh, from the secretary himself. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Joel. Um, if I may clarify, I have not made any stand yet. 
but NEDA as a constitution under Secretary Pernia had not uh, supported that. Uh, the reason for that at that time was uh, they did not think it will be um, uh, beneficial or uh, be the answer to the concerns raised. Uh, however, I, I, have, uh, I have begun to review this again. And personally, there are many trade-offs when we create new departments, uh, especially if the mandates are being done uh, by other offices. Uh, but uh, given the developments, um, the COVID, uh, the need to uh, look after millions of OFWs, I've actually, I'm actually more open to it. But uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, NEDA has provided a stand. What I, what I requested the team really is to look into how we can improve the uh, provisions of the bill. For instance, one of the concerns was whether uh, we need such a department uh, that will last uh, for a long time. Uh, for instance, uh, as we know, the uh, Department of Agrarian Reform uh, continues to exist uh, even after uh, certain uh, functions have already ceased. So what I actually told them was to look into the time period. Maybe we can uh, evaluate every few years whether such a department or agency is uh, actually needed. So uh, my stand right now, uh, Mr. Chair, is I'm open to it, uh, but I think there are some provisions that we can help you uh, further improve. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Chua, and perhaps we'll give you a copy of uh, the bill uh, sent to us by PLLO because we don't want the same thing happening again uh, with, with, with our experience with the security of tenure bill. Um, I, I take your, your, your point on the importance of the uh, continuous evaluation and perhaps putting a sunset provision, etc. No? But let's, 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 let's put it on record, let's spread it on record. What is really the policy, the policy of the uh, government with regard to uh, the creation of new departments? And you um, know what are the factors you are looking at to determine the necessity of creating a new department, the timing? You said you're open, like for instance, at this point in time, uh, the height of the pandemic, is it the right time? Or what is the policy, uh, Your Honor? Uh, Mr. Chair, in um, I think in July of 2019, uh, Secretary Dominguez Pernia and Abuel wrote the Congress at the opening of the Congress on the joint position of the economic team on certain uh, bills. Uh, one of those uh, positions is on the creation of new departments on creation of eco zones and so on. What we actually propose there is that uh, instead of creating eco zones or departments or agencies one at a time, we look at it as a package. Uh, number one, uh, for instance, uh, will the department really address, a new department really address the problems that we are facing? Sometimes uh, that department kasi has uh, budget problems or management problems and not necessarily a new department would solve. So we are we propose actually, uh, not me, uh, but the, the three secretaries at that time propose that all, ben all, all department creation, eco zones and so on, uh, be supported at least by a cost benefit analysis. So that is the position. Now, uh, now to apply it to each and every department uh, would be case to case because uh, uh, there are already uh, certain uh, factors that are in play. Uh, for instance, COVID will probably change a lot of the um, priorities. So we have to factor that into consideration also. Thank you. Secretary, to, to save time, perhaps uh, we'll, we'll send you a copy or if you can get a copy from BLLO of the... Uh... Uh, revised, revised, na po ito, eh, revised uh, bill on the creation of oil dogs. And we, we want to get your, 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 your insights no? and uh, just to also uh, relate to you the, the, the breaking news yesterday, the House uh, passed another eco zone in Bulacan. And so I, 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 I'm, not, I, I'm not sure of your, 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 your uh, position there if you will. Uh, like, also ask for, for, for the president to, to veto the measure. Sana magsalita ano mo kayo before we, we do something you know, in, in, in the Senate. But uh, ako personally, I am, I am for it, uh, not only because I'm from Bulacan, but I also know the benefits of, uh, of having that uh, particular uh, 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 project. Uh, last but not the least, yung policy on gambling, uh, Mr. Secretary. What's the government's uh, policy on gambling, including online gaming? Is it one of uh, promotion or moderation? 
uh, do we see actually do we really see uh, revenues coming from this sector as a reliable and uh, consistent uh, source of income in the coming years? Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I would take a neutral approach on that. Um, uh, there, there is. I don't know if there is a law that prohibits them. Uh, therefore, uh, they can operate so long as they comply with our rules. The is that everything, every gambling in this country is illegal unless there is a law. <laughs> nagiging legal. So even the illegal, they pass on the batas, nagiging legal. So that's the problem. And I think, you know, uh, we have always... I, because I wanted to specifically talk about Pogo, we have been uh, saying and uh, been uh, pointing out the need to, to, to study the benefits of this uh, industry. This will be the uh, overall economic uh, contribution and uh, unintended consequences. You have the rising criminality, prostitution, money laundering, uh, 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 rise in uh, property uh, uh, prices, among others. And, we have conducted several hearings no, here in the Senate, sa Committee on Labor, sa, sa Committee on Women, etc., no, brought about by, by the industry. And according to BSP, just to point this out, Secretary, the net financial inflow from the Pogo industry is only $7 billion for three years, or just 0.013% of annual GDP. So may I know if NEDA... Uh, already have a, a study on this. This is my last question, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I hope that uh, because we are finalizing the committee report and uh, we wanted to get the, the inputs of uh, NEDA on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do not know. Uh, maybe I should consult with Yusek Rose later if we have done a full study, but we have the numbers uh, from various agencies and uh, based on those numbers, it appears to be a substantial share of the economy because of the consumption, the housing, transport, those uh, drivers bringing the workers back and forth. But I, I do not know if all of them or the far majority are, are even registered legally. And our position there is they should register. Right. Yeah, they should register and contribute. Otherwise, the contribution is not enough and not fair. In our last hearing, Secretary, about 50 billion pesos unpaid taxes ang hindi nabayaran last year. So, just to put that Thank you very much, Secretary, for your patience. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, dear colleagues. Thank you. Thank you for those interventions, uh, Secretary Joel. Yeah, who is uh, requesting the floor? Uh, I, hear I don't know if Yusek Rose would like to discuss if any study has been conducted. Is that Yusek Rose? Yusek Rose Epilion. Siguro submit na lang, Mr. Chair. We wanted to hear from our minority floor leader. Okay, we will. Yeah, we will just we will just submit, Mr. Chair. Yeah, please submit it to the committee and and to the office of Senator Joel, please. Okay, sure. Thank you, thank you, Yusek Rose. Uh, we'll now give the floor to our minority leader, the very hardworking. Uh, all present, uh, <laughs> Senator Frank Dillon, former Senator. I'd like to commend him, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, uh, let me state on the record that I'm looking forward to the uh, uh, appointment of our uh, uh, of Secretary uh, Carl Chua as a regular secretary. He will have the support, I think, of the Senate uh, contingent in the CA. But having said that, let me be a little parochial before I start to ask questions on the data budget. Uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, may we know what is the status of the Panay Iloilo Bridge, which is part of the uh, flagship build-build-build uh, uh, program of data? Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair and M Minority Leader. Uh, I understand that uh, there is a change in the ODA financing source, and that the uh, Koreans have agreed uh, because the project is very big to look at the first segment, which is the uh, Panay Gimaras segment, and that is under discussion. I understand on the financing uh, for the detailed engineering design. Yeah, that was the status a month ago, Mr. Secretary. Uh, uh, it is, the movement. Uh, 
Uh, it is still the same status that I have received, uh, Mr. Chair. Can we move it a little bit uh, forward, Mr. Secretary? Uh, the discussion right now is uh, between Korean and the uh, Department of Finance. So let me uh, consult with the DOF on how we can speed that up. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, okay, on, on the second point, uh, may we know the status of the privatization of the Ilui report? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Frank, I understand that initially they have submitted a joint venture. Uh, however, uh, they have uh, taken it back and they would like to submit instead a PPP as the mode of the uh, implementing the port. Uh, this is now under the review of the Philippine Ports Authority. So NEDA has not received it uh, as of this moment. Well, I, I, I'm sorry, Mr. Secretary, but the PPA board approved it last month already, and it's supposed to be already with NEDA. The board, okay. uh, the last uh, meeting in July of the PPA yeah. approved. Okay, uh, th thank you for the clarification. Uh, it was indeed approved, uh, I am mistaken. Uh, but we have not yet received uh, the, in NEDA the submission for the evaluation by the ICC. Yeah, but, uh, yes, I do hope that we can evaluate this uh, quickly because we need infrastructure in the provinces. And in these particular cases, our uh, regional director of NEDA in Region 6 uh, is doing her share and uh, pushing hard for these projects because we know that the Balik Provincia program is premised on provide on, on a situation where there is employment available in the rural areas, particularly in the Visayas and Mindanao, because uh, our workers will go to where the jobs are available. If we cannot put up the proper infrastructure, that's why I'm pointing out to this privatization of the Ilo port, because unless we have a good port, we cannot uh, attract uh, industries to come to the pro go to the provinces uh, in order that they can provide employment. Uh, so we hope that this can be given more attention, uh, Mr. Secretary, in so far as Region 6 is concerned. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, we will do so, Mr. Chair. Now, we go now to the budget. Uh, you, you cited as part of your accomplishment that uh, you prepared the We Recover as One report which is the budget guidelines for 2021 budget and became the framework of the national expenditure program for 2021. So under this uh, report uh, that you cited, Mr. Secretary, what does NEDA consider more critical for future growth uh, given the uh, present circumstances? Is it the physical capital or the human capital? Let me remind, uh, let, let me cite for the record uh, uh, the, uh, the PIDS study last month, which basically says, and I quote from the report, the number of poor Filipinos could rise by about 1.5 billion from the baseline figures if everyone's income contract, contract by 10%, even without the social amelioration program and the small business wage subsidy in place. Without the SAP and the SBWS, the number of poor uh, uh, could rise, would rise even by 5.5 million pesos, the paper of the PID has said. So I am just wondering uh, under the uh, uh, WRA or report that you, uh, that you, that you uh, crafted, what is given more preference uh, on, on, on well, the, the physical capital or the human capital? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, we actually give both uh, importance. Uh, it's very hard to just uh, focus on one or the other, but just to highlight some of the things that are actually, uh, uh, I would say, uh, the um, uh, putting both together, we, we have advocated, for instance, fast-tracking our ICT programs. And one of the reasons for that is to support online and remote uh, learning. So in that case, actually, the physical and human capital are being addressed uh, together. Uh, uh, one of the things that we are also uh, focusing on is the 
um, capacity for the government to implement uh, community-based delivery. That is why the CBMS is actually one of the key areas that we want to push here. Uh, we also want to uh, improve, for instance, the delivery of local governments of various uh, basic services. Uh, those are some of the key areas that we have put. Uh, Yusek Rose is the main author. Would you like to come in? Uh, well, uh, I can live with your answer because like all economists, at the end of the answer, we could not understand what this exact situation is. Sorry for my saying that, but that's, that's typical of all economists when I ask a question. At the end of the day, uh, I, you know, both sides are given, uh, are, are treated in a manner that uh, uh, we could not get a definite answer. So I assume uh, that that's the same uh, uh, response I will get. But uh, if you're saying that if it is equally important, huh, uh, it would appear that uh, the, uh, that the uh, most of the additional spending is going to our infrastructure. Um, uh, according to uh, in the news today, uh, it was reported that our human capital scores slightly declined in the human capital index. And according to World Bank study, the Philippine expenditures for health and education are relatively lower than the average expenditure of countries in the same income level. So would you care to comment on that in relation to the uh, uh, guidelines that you set for the National Expenditure Program next, for next year? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Frank. Uh, we, we are concerned about the result of the latest World Bank study. Uh, in fact, uh, prior to that, we already got some of the results from our National Nutrition Survey, uh, which showed that about a third of our children remain uh, malnourished. And the scores that we have seen in education through the PISA test uh, result are also not uh, up to the um, uh, the performance that we want. So this is uh, very much concerning. And uh, we would like to highlight that uh, there are um, a lot of things we need to do. Number one is we have been providing a lot of money to social services over the years. Uh, we would have to evaluate uh, at as soon as possible time how these have actually translated to results. Uh, the second is I think we should continue some of the very good programs that we have and implement it better. I think the conditional cash transfer, which started in 2008 and now is a law, uh, can, can, can still uh, provide the um, reason to uh, improve some of these outcomes. Uh, in the uh, government, uh, one of the subcommittees of the Development Budget Coordination Committee is the uh, TWG on the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which we receive some funding, and that will be one of the key priorities also. So not only are we looking at the macro fiscal, uh, we will also begin to take a serious look on the SDGs. Uh, the good thing, uh, Mr. Chair, is uh, we have seen uh, significant progress in our poverty reduction effort. Uh, we promised to lift 6 million Filipinos out of poverty by 2022. That was achieved early on in 2018. Uh, COVID might uh, slow that or reverse it slightly. So the efforts that we will put in place in the next few years are important to reverse uh, the impact of COVID on that. Thank you. Um, well, uh, I can debate with you on that because it would appear that that policy is not reflected uh, in the uh, 2021 National Expenditure Program. For one, there is no more location for the social amelioration, uh, the SAP, uh, and the, uh, uh, and the, uh, the small business wage subsidy in 2021, to my recollection, correct if I'm wrong. So that without the SAP and the, uh, and the uh, small business wage subsidy, by your own research of the PIDS, the number of the poor would rise even by 5.5 million uh, Filipinos. Is this correct? Uh, I understand that is the study. That is why um, we are proposing the uh, gradual recovery, or uh, gradual opening up rather of the economy. Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, amount that we will have to put uh, artificially during a quarantine and ECQ is significant. That's 100 billion for the poorest 18 million per month. 
And if we have to do this every month, then that would be really costly. So we are proposing that a more efficient and sustainable manner is to open up the economy as much as we can. Between uh, January and April of this year, uh, we saw 8 million plus jobs uh, disappear because of the quarantine, the strictest quarantine. But between April and June of uh, April and July of uh, this year, when we moved from ECQ to GCQ, uh, we saw 7.5 million jobs come back and the unemployment rate fell from 17.7 to 10 percent. Our average unemployment rate is around 5 percent. So we see the gradual opening up of the economy actually as the more sustainable answer. Uh, but for the time being, we have an, a, a lot of uh, social protection programs in the budget, the regular ones that we can use uh, to support the most vulnerable. Yeah, well, I, I would like to think that a more uh, pronounced intervention of the, the government, at least for next year, could alleviate the difficulties and the hunger that we see because of COVID-19. Would you agree with that? Uh, I, I would uh, suppose yes, uh, and to use the regular budget that is proposed as our first uh, way to um, address the needs of the people. Uh, Mr. Chair, we are doing this in a very uncertain time. So the moment we see the data coming out, for instance, the next quarter's uh, GDP and labor force, uh, we, we of course are open to making those adjustments. Uh, but we think that uh, the progress that we saw with the gradual opening up of the economy is the more sustainable manner. So instead of just being totally risk averse, we have to just face the fact that this virus will be here for several more months and we will have to deal with it and manage the risk. Yeah, in other words, you are open to further realignments which is authorized under Bayanihan II as a power of the president. Uh, yes, and also uh, be guided by the wisdom of Congress to uh, make adjustments as needed. And, and we would be uh, relying on the latest data in the next few months to guide us on that. Thank you very much. We'll get back to that at the appropriate time. Now, uh, Mr. Secretary, what is your assessment of our investment growth performance? I am raising this issue because I'm looking at the data of the Philippine Statistics Authority and uh, quarter three of 2018 saw an, in, uh, an increase of 4.3% in our investment in growth uh, as I contribute. Uh, uh, but this has been decreasing. So from about 4.3% increase in third quarter of 2018, it has, gone down, it has uh, contracted by almost 14% in the second quarter of this year, 13.9% uh, to be specific, uh, to be precise, um, uh, under the PIDS reports. Now, um, how confident are we that we can reverse this trend uh, 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 before uh, we are about to approve a debate in the Senate uh, the uh, CREATE bill, which will uh, rationalize the fiscal incentives. Uh, I, you know, I, I support this measure, although I have misgivings about the timing uh, of, of, of the measure. Uh, so, may I know uh, what are uh, what are the programs? Or first, do you recognize this problem? And number two, how do you propose to address it? And uh, furthermore. Uh, in the recent months, we saw uh, investments uh, or companies leaving China because of the uh, uh, issues uh, between the United States and uh, China. And uh, there was an, uh, a, a, a number of companies that left China. Unfortunately, and the huge investments were made, for example, in Indonesia, in Vietnam, uh, both of U.S. and Japanese companies. In fact, the Japanese companies were given subsidy by the Japanese government to get out of China, but none of us came to our shore. So how do you account for this? Uh, thank you. Um, you are referring, uh, Mr. Minority Leader, to foreign direct investments. Not yes. The yes. Investment, not the public yes. investments. Yes. Because uh, in the case, case, uh, has been declining. Uh, yes. And also the recent news, and it has not helped that the recent news about we are, are not being able to attract any of the companies leaving China is uh, confirms this decline in our FDIs. Thank you. 
Um, um, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Minority Leader, my position has not changed uh, between my stay in DOF and NEDA. Um, we have a tax incentive system that basically grants incentives uh, that are not performance-based, targeted, time-bound, and transparent. And in fact, uh, even without the CETIRA or the CREATE, we have noticed investments uh, uh, in PESA, approved investments decline. So we would like to look at this from a bigger perspective. Number one, um, should we uh, also look at the infrastructure, the logistics, the ease of doing business, and the uh, ease of uh, foreign capital coming into the country? So that is, I think, the first thing we need to do. Uh, and that is what we have actually uh, advocated as part of the 10-point socioeconomic agenda. Uh, number two, uh, Mr. Chair, the CREATE or the CETIRA actually addresses a lot of the concerns. Presently, if we grant incentive, it's the same package, whether it's Manila or in Marawi. Uh, in CETIRA or CREATE, um, I understand that uh, it is still there. We are granting targeted incentives, uh, more incentives to the poor regions and priority sectors, and in fact, giving the president the authority to provide even more incentives or longer period for strategically important firms. So uh, I think the best way to attract incentives would be, number one, to uh, sorry, the best way to attract investments would be, number one, to address the other uh, structural problems uh, through our infrastructure, ease of doing business, uh, public service act amendment, so that capital can come in easily. And the second is to incentivize good performance through the CREATE by ensuring that when we grant incentives, it's targeted performance-based. And in fact, uh, we are willing to uh, provide tailor-fitted incentives to attract the strategically important ones to come in. And I think this is a better way of providing the incentives. Finally, uh, I also support the need to evaluate and to regularly monitor uh, the performance of those receiving incentives. Uh, that is presently not possible because incentives are given forever. Uh, but if we have something like the Fiscal Incentives Review Board, then that may incentivize better performance. And when I went to Singapore and Malaysia, that is the system that they have there to ensure that the investment actually uh, materialize. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, just on the, uh, to incentivize uh, uh, the uh, uh, companies which want to come in. Uh, you, you know, I think you, you mentioned about higher incentives for the poor regions. I have to take a second look at the CETIRA on, on the CREATE, whether in fact it does that in a very significant manner. I know that under the proposed measure, the president is given a uh, latitude in extending the uh, incentives to certain industries upon the fulfillment of certain conditions. But I do not find, and I may have missed it, I don't find anything in the CREATE or the CETIRA which specifically uh, provides for a higher incentive for locating, say, in the Visayas and in Mindanao. Is there one? Okay, uh, in the CETIRA that we uh, submitted when I was in DOF, uh, it is there. I understand it is still there in the committee report. Uh, in fact, uh, there are two ways to do the targeting. One is by geography. So there are three tiers, one for the highly urbanized uh, cities. And then there are the second one for the more developed provinces. And the third one would be for the less developed provinces. So the incentive and length of availment are uh, different, longer for those that are in poor areas. And also there is another one, as far as I remember, on uh, basic, enhanced, and advanced industries where we want to prioritize our yes. uh, incentives. Yes, the basic industries, uh, and uh, yes, I see that there. Uh, but uh, would you, you mind if you ask, you said that you are, you are continuously endorsing these incentives uh, to, that would incentivize locating outside of Metro Manila. Uh, you're saying this is in, in, in the Sitira. Uh, would you, would your staff do me the favor of uh, looking at the present version of CREATE and see whether that provision is still there, which, uh, I, I, uh, which I can see you're supporting? Because this is very important to us, because uh, as, a, as a policy, the President has, and the Department of Finance has discouraged the establishment of uh, free trade zones and uh, establishing and providing incentives uh, to these areas, but you are saying now that uh, you are generally uh, endorsing 
uh, granting incentives to allow or to encourage companies to invest in outside of uh, Metro Manila area. And I, I, I would like to think that's a policy in the right direction. If you want your uh, Balik Provincia uh, program to succeed, uh, Mr. Secretary. Uh, yes, uh, just to clarify, uh, Mr. Senator, um, in the last Congress, we saw at least 26 bills creating various economic zones. And in fact, uh, this continues to be the process. At this rate, we think that at one time, the entire country might become an economic zone. Uh, what we're basically saying is that uh, there are areas where economic zones are needed. Uh, there are areas where I, we do not think they are the priority. Uh, the Cetira or CREATE uh, basically is uh, about granting incentives to investments. Uh, not a uh, creation of a zone actually has so many other provisions that are beyond the tax, uh, such as uh, uh, the autonomy or authority to actually conduct business outside the scope of the local government. So I think that has to be revisited. But the Cetira Create is really about uh, directly targeting the right kind of uh, in investments that we would like to attract to particular locations of the country and giving them the appropriate time-bound incentives. Thank yes. you. An incentive based on the geographical location. And the industry. And the industry, yeah. yes. To me, more first on the geographical location because we want to decongest Manila and attract yes. our workers to go back. But I'm telling you, Mr. Secretary, that without providing jobs in the provinces, your Alec Provincia program will never succeed. Because yes. it's human nature that people who look for jobs so they come back to Manila where the companies are. So first, I would like to reiterate my request, if you can uh, point out to me, because I've not seen it, mm -hmm. the uh, uh, provisions uh, which will, uh, in, in the CREATE bill, which will incentivize geographic uh, location, uh, as you have mentioned. And if there is that there, I would request that you give us uh, provisions that will uh, uh, that will uh, make this policy a reality so uh, thank you uh, 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 th th thank yes. you we will do so thank you uh, yeah um, now ju just well this is actually for for the central bank but uh, <clears throat> is it is my impression correct that there is a general reluctance to borrow today because of the lack of confidence in uh, our ability to be able to recover faster than projected? Uh, I am not aware of that. Uh, I think the DOF might be able to answer that better, Mr. Chair. Well, uh, okay. Uh, yes, or, or the central bank probably, yeah. yes. Uh, Now, on a little sensitive issue, uh, because again, it has been in the news recently, has our economy benefited from our closer ties with China? Uh, Mr. Senator, in what terms are you referring to? For example, uh, uh, how much are the ODA loans and funds from China? Uh, uh, is uh, uh, China, does China rank in the list of our sources of loans and grants? Uh, and how many uh, ODAs from China has uh, materialized? Uh, these are the general, uh, uh, yeah, the general uh, issues that I would like to hear from uh, the responses to which I would like to hear from NEDA. Uh, Mr. Chair, I don't have exactly the answer, but as far as I know, um, the total stock is much, much less because uh, I think the Chinese have just started to participate more in the infrastructure program in the ODAs. Uh, in fact, I understand that uh, the number of uh, projects that they're supporting is also less than the total stock that we get from Japan or the World Bank or the ADB. I have not looked at all the other numbers uh, to see if our if that has improved. Yes. Uh, would you mind submitting to us 
a report on this on this point because you know it always gets controversial, uh, including uh, uh, the uh, the uh, authority of of a telecommunication company where in China has a very substantial investment. The the ITO telecommunication company is allowed to put up several towers in uh, in on military basis. The fact that NGCP uh, uh, is. Uh, uh, 40 percent, I think it's the equity of the, of the Chinese government is also very substantial and this poses, uh, this poses uh, security issues insofar as country is concerned. So that is why you cannot blame the public uh, and the media when they raise uh, concerns about the presence of this, uh, of, the, uh, of, this, uh, of the Chinese government in very vital industries and uh, the telecommunication company again comes into four uh, recently so we would like to have that uh, uh, that listing uh, mr secretary uh, yes mr chair i have to get back uh, with on the questions that are being proposed by the minority leader yes <laughs> um on the still on the flagship infra project, there are you mentioned 105 uh, new uh, in, in, uh, flagship infra projects. Uh, there are 104 in the latest uh, list of infrastructure flagship projects. Uh, how many are included in the uh, 2021 national expenditure program? And uh, what's the total amount of these projects? But first. Uh, you know, how many are included in the 2021 uh, NAP? Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, selection of the 104 is based on their readiness to be implemented in 2021. So all of them uh, are included, at least uh, certain segments of their uh, uh, implementation. For instance, uh, the construction phase, the pre-implementation right-of-way because uh, that is the basis for putting the 104 that uh, they start next year mm. or continue next year yeah. okay so again uh, 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 may we in please include in your report uh, the uh, new ppp projects that the uh, uh, i'm sorry i'm jumping <clears throat> Uh, yes, we will uh, submit the, the list and the details. Yes, thank you. Yes. <clears throat> uh, on the Philippine Statistics Authority, uh, Mr. Chairman, the NEDA has set as one of its major goals for the fourth quarter of 2020, the pre-registration of nine million Filipinos and the registration of 5 million Filipinos in the national ID as a measure to mitigate COVID among low-income households. I fully endorse that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but uh, with the uh, national ID program status fund implement, uh, of fund utilization, uh, it shows a continuous decline in uh, obligation rates. Is that correct? Uh, there was a two billion in the budget of 2019 uh, that was not uh, obligated until early 2020, uh, but that has been addressed already. In fact, uh, we are preparing in advance for next year so that uh, we don't have to wait for the budget to be given and then start the procurement of the remaining registration. Uh, we have actually requested from DBM additional amount of 1.9 billion so that we can start the preparation and continue uh, smoothly towards uh, next year. Thank you. That's a good assurance, uh, Mr. Chair, because I'm a little bit concerned that uh... You know, we are not, not, not we are not walking the talk. Uh, we say that the ID system is very important, but uh, uh, I, I keep on reading about realignments uh, uh, from the uh, from this program. Uh, uh, now you're saying that the, it has your full support, and uh, and insofar as the budget is concerned, uh, there should be no problem. Yes, uh, we we actually got all the budget needed for all the IT. Uh, mm -hmm. Right now, we are 
uh, moving from the IT part to the registration preparation. And that is what next year's budget uh, and our request for advance uh, is uh, needed to prepare on the registration. With, uh, with the indulgence of uh, the minority leader, where is the where is the where is the finish line for this, uh, Secretary Carl? Well, we we were requested uh, to finish the registration of all ninety million uh, within the term of the administration. But what uh, what are the that's only registration? What are the other? Uh, we were talking about an ID, no? So what are the other processes so we can actually have that ID functioning in the hands of our countrymen? Uh, well, um, under the law, it is a foundational ID, meaning it is the one single uh, source or basis of your identity. And that number will be reflected in all the other functional IDs. The, uh, if you are uh, 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 asking Mr. Chair about the use cases, there are many use cases. Once you have an ID, our first priority for those with no bank account is the opening of a bank account. And then uh, there are many. So, what is the finish the line, uh, Yusek Carl? What, before you go to the uses, what mm -hmm. is the finish line for the NEDA aside from registration? What are the other processes involved? Because uh, we want to see the forest for the trees, eh, from the trees. We want to separate it. Well, the 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 finish line is really to provide 90 million people IDs. That is that is really the finish line. Now the ID will have many other uses. So what when kailan yung finish line na yan, yung providing the 90 million at saka right. ano, yung, ano yung cost because we don't want kami sa dito sa Congress we're willing to help you naman but we don't want a bottomless pit I think that's what the minority leader is also driving at no that's why we're trying to drill down on these various stages so could you could you maybe take a step back and and give us the forest after registration what are the what are the operative procedures Oh no um once the person finishes the registration, meaning submit the biometrics and the uh, basic information, uh, he is given a card in the following months. And that card is really the finish line. Now, uh, the national ID doesn't end with the ID itself because the purpose is beyond the national ID. That is why the next step is to provide uh, bank accounts for those without any bank account. But the, the finish line, according to the law, is the provision of a physical ID, which eventually will be a digital one. So when will all Filipinos have that ID, uh, Sir Carl? Uh, according to the Filsis roadmap submitted by the PSA, uh, the 90 million, uh, which are those that are five years old and above, uh, would be in 2022. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Minority Leader, for uh, lending me some of your time. Yes, uh, I, I concur with the, uh, with, the uh, with the observations of the chair. Um, so the finish line is 2022, when the 90 million Filipinos would have in their physical possession an ID. Is that what we're looking at, uh, Mr. Secretary? Yes, that is the finish line. Um, yeah, um, 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 may we know exactly when in 2022? Is it the end of the term of present administration? Uh, the original plan, uh, Mr. Chair, is the calendar year, but we are moving uh, to uh, try to deliver before uh, the end of the term. All right, um, yes. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, this is an ID, the number of which uh, uh, can be used in all transactions. Including yes, in ID, SSS number, driver's license, TIN, etc., etc., etc. Yes, uh, being a foundational ID, that yes. ID should be used uh, to uh, connect to all the other functional IDs. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, people will still need to get other IDs like a passport, a driver's license, and so on. And the important one is uh, all these will have to be linked by the single national ID. Mm-hmm, okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, <clears throat> uh, 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 finally, I joined the request of the chair that uh, uh, we be furnished copies of the uh, PIDS uh, research studies that you mentioned. There's the, there are eight of them, so uh, if we can be um, uh, included in that. Um, uh -huh. One final issue, why is the agriculture sector not getting 
sufficient support from the budget. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, proposal of uh, uh, Department of Agriculture was capped uh, tremendously. And in fact, uh, in the second quarter of this year, only agriculture was able to, to survive the onslaught of COVID-19 by uh, expanding by about 1.9% versus the contraction of the rest of the sectors. So may we ask uh, why is there uh, a reluctance to uh, provide more assistance to agriculture when in fact our poor is basically in the countryside and they're poor because they depend on agriculture? Uh, Mr. Chair, actually, this is one of the important questions that I, uh, as NED, the Acting Secretary, would like to answer. In fact, the observation is that we have been putting uh, hundreds of billions in agriculture over many years. And why is it that the outcome, uh, in terms of the uh, farmers uh, rising in the income ladder and agriculture production at least 2%, which should be at least the minimum production rate to, uh, to feed the people is not being achieved. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, this is not only about the allocation of the budget. It is also about the, uh, sorry, it is not only the amount of the money in the budget, it is how we allocate and use them. And mm -hmm. also it is about uh, policies that I think have restricted our agriculture sector that have hindered competition and increased mm -hmm. productivity. Uh, for instance, uh, when we, uh, before, uh, we had the policy of protecting the rice sector, but at the cost of having everyone in the country buy uh, rice at the highest price. With the rice tarification, we have reduced it significantly, the rice price of rice, yes. and at the same time put uh, a guaranteed 60 billion peso for mechanization in the agriculture rice sector. Uh, number two, I think, uh, is the fact that many of the land distributed are not yet individualized. So there is a project under DAR to split those collective titles into individual titles. Uh, I think Bayanihan too also has the provision to condone the interest and penalties of ARBs. So I think it is not just the money, uh, Mr. Senator, it is also how we deliver the package. And I have requested my NEDA staff to evaluate actually the agriculture sector. Uh, is there any policy uh, direction that you would want uh, to push through the enactment of laws insofar as this is concerned? Uh, something like, you know, the program on the rice tarification, which uh, as you have cited correctly, has uh, resulted in, uh, in, in a, a, better, a better structure for our uh, farmers and also for our consumers. Are there similar uh, policies that you would want to push uh, that could address the challenges that we meet along the way in pushing agriculture as a major for a major economic input? Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Chair, from the NEDA perspective, we have uh, sufficient uh, tools and policies. I think the main challenge is the implementation. But if I may add another policy reform that we have been uh, proposing, together with DOF and BSP is the amendment to the Agri-Agra law. Mm -hmm. And is there anything pending already in our in, in, in the Congress on that? I understand that the House uh, has or is soon to pass its version. And uh, we are in discussion with the Agriculture Committee on the version of the Senate. Yeah, well, we have not, uh, that is not in the consciousness of the uh, senators. Uh, so uh, finally, just a statement that uh, I agree with your position that uh, in the creation of departments, uh, we should not do it piecemeal, but we should have a general plan as to how many departments should be created, especially where the function is already performed by an existing department and we carve it out to put up another department. We must be, uh, we must have a careful assessment as to whether or not this is the right direction because we all know that creating a department enlarges the bureaucracy. Uh, that is why the issue of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of uh, looking at the entire uh, forest rather than looking at the trees uh, is uh, important to me. Um, so with that, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you for accommodating our questions, even if we exceeded our time a little. Thank you very much. Thank you, distinguished minority leader. 
Uh, you said Carl, uh, said Carl. Yeah, we're very glad. I, I, I echo the sentiments of uh, Vice Chair Joel and the Minority Leader. We're happy to see you there. And we hope uh, you, your appointment will be made permanent. You bring energy and idealism. You've proven yourself uh, as a USEC at the DOF, and you've worked very closely with the legislators. But I have a, num a number of questions of my own. I'd like to acknowledge also that uh, our Senate President Pro Temp, Ralph Recto, was here. I don't know if he's still here. He can come in any time to ask questions. Senator Nancy Binay, I saw her also turn on her monitor and she's free to ask questions. But in the meantime, the chair has a number of concerns because uh, we want to take advantage of your presence there. You know, it, it's uh, you're very qualified, highly qualified. So you mentioned also there's I'm happy that you mentioned uh, in response to the minority leader that you'll be coming up with some studies on agriculture. No? Uh, just some observations on agriculture is that uh, there's no policy continuity between administrations, really. Uh, one secretary, under one president, they wanted to give away so much fertilizer. Uh, another president, they want to build so many farm-to-market roads. So there's no policy continuity. That's why any roadmap that the that the NEDA will come up with will be useful, I think, for the both the lawmakers and whoever will sit uh, in the Department of Agriculture. No? And also, all of these... Uh, uh, you know, there's so many separate kingdoms under the uh, DA uh, ambit, no? There's so many. There must be about 20 to 30 uh, attached agencies and uh, corporations. So maybe the way you made sense of NFA, you can also apply those principles towards uh, con principles of consumer protection in terms of price protection, affordable prices. You can apply those also. Uh, along with the goals of uh, increasing incomes for our farmers, et cetera, because uh, I think the problems are already well documented in terms of uh, the younger generation not wanting to enter that field, no, because it's it's not seen to be very attractive in terms of incomes and uh, mahirap. Minsan, you're breaking your back just to break even. No? So, so could you put your eyes uh, and then let us know how we can help you, but also on public transport, for instance. We have... Uh, I think these are some of the bigger problems confronting our society and our country, like public transport. We have so many MRTs, LRTs that everyone is confused. Actually, the, I think the general public is confused. Can the NEDA serve as some kind of a unifying force or a rational force in terms of uh, coming up with a plan, uh, a roadmap uh, for this, uh, Secretary Carl? Because, you know, we also subsidize the LRT ridership, eh, right? Uh, kada, no, we spend uh, millions, hundreds of millions there. So we want to make sense of that also going forward. And uh, there are so many, kumbaga, so many moving parts uh, of the of the public transport picture, no. Uh, and you know, there's so much jockeying for all these projects, etc. What is the best way to go about them? And perhaps what are the best practices we've learned along the way, no? And then I'd like to also talk about jobs and poverty because it's very much in the news because the House Budget Committee or Appropriations Committee is hearing the DSWD budget. And I think there was a DSWD resource person who was quoted as saying that the number of uh, poor families could reach 20 million. Is that is that uh, something on your radar, Sek Carl? Uh, poor families? Uh, yeah, yeah, I was surprised because uh, uh, 18 no. million yung sinabi mo kanina. How many, uh, how many families are there in the whole well, country to begin with? Okay, um, I understand there are 26 million families as okay. of the uh, uh, latest uh, projections. Of the okay. 26 million, 18 million are low income. Low income meaning uh, below the minimum wage of their region. Uh, okay. But they are not necessarily poor because the government defines the poor as those below the poverty threshold. So those uh, they are low income, they must be supported, but they are not considered poor. They are ilan the near poor. Yeah, ilan ilan yung poor sa 18 million. Um, you said, Dennis, is it around four, three to four million? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Ang uh, official poverty uh, in terms of uh, uh, families po, 3 million families. In terms of number, 17.67, around 18 million uh, Filipinos. So just to clarify, there are 4.4, 4.3 to 4.4 recipients, family, recipient families of the CCT. And you're saying there's only 3 million poor families. So how do you classify the 1.4 million who are receiving it but are not technically poor? Near poor because uh, they are vulnerable. 
Okay, and, and, and some uh, of them, some of them uh, may have been poor before and graduated because they continue to receive the CCT until they graduate and meet their uh, the conditions. Copy, copy. What what is the definition of poor? Is it still the below fifty pesos a, a day? Is that still the definition? Uh, I think the uh, Yusuf Dennis, the official definition uh, below the poverty threshold is what? Um, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, mayroon po kasi tayong tinatawag na minimum basic needs. Uh, so, uh, kinocompute po namin yung uh, poverty threshold and uh, below that, that is the uh, number of families that are that are poor. Uh, ilan yon? Ilan yung basic needs? We asked that from you from the budget, I remember. Eh. You talked about that, but uh, it hasn't quite sunk in. Because it's it's a bit a bit more complex than past uh, metrics. The uh, 2018 uh, poverty threshold po per person is 25,800. That's a month, no? 25,800. Uh, per person po yon, um, uh, Mr. Chair. So let's say uh, an average of uh, five uh, in a family. That would be about 126,000. Um, a month per uh, family. Because po a yung Poverty threshold that and I per person. So that's about uh, 25, 25,813 per year per person. 25,800 per person per year. Yes, Paul. So anything below that is poor. Yes, Mr. Uh, Chair. Do you have a new number for the near poor in terms of families and in terms of incomes? Uh, Mr. Chair, yung uh, uh, benchmark natin, kasi wala tayong official definition ng near poor, although there are studies uh, conducted by PIDS na let's say mayroon tayong 10% uh, above the poverty rate. Uh, so that is uh, one classification of the near poor. So for example, uh, I mentioned kanina, 25,800 yung poverty. So pwedeng near poor siya pag uh, higher than 10%. So uh, that is uh, the near poor uh, definition. But that is not official. 10 that is guided by the research. In percent of what? In uh, percent of the per uh, capita uh, poverty threshold, Mr. Chair. So, for so example, 2,500. Higher, higher. Yeah. So you're saying if he earns something like 25,800 plus 10 percent of that, he is near poor. Yes. yes uh, that is one classification, okay. Mr. Chair. Okay, can you submit to us the, the committee the classifications? And how many classifications of the 26 million families in the Philippines, how many classifications do they fall into? You uh, mentioned Mr. poor and near poor. Uh, Mr. Chair, as I mentioned, the PSA uh, only uh, uh, notes of the poverty threshold. So you are either a poor or non-poor. Not poor. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, there are studies, as I mentioned, by PIDS, uh, sina Dr. Vic Bakeo introduced the concept of the near poor. So that is not uh, official, but uh, because we have the numbers, we can actually compute for that. Ilan yung near poor? The near poor, uh, yung 10% uh, higher. Ilan, ilan, ilan be... yun? How many million families? Ah, okay, uh, Mr. Chair, based on our uh, numbers, that would uh, constitute an additional of around 800,000 families above the... Uh, the poverty threshold. So you've already disposed of around 3.8 million families. Around, around that number, Mr. Chair. Yeah, between the poor and the near poor, you're talking about 3.8 million based on what you've told us so far. So you're leaving another 22.2 million families. And how do you classify those? Do you, is there a middle class? Is there an upper class? Is there a lower class? Can you, can we, I were trying to, again, uh, to borrow the words of Senator Frank, again, we want to see the forest so we know uh, how, who, how to target our policies better. Uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, official, uh, because we are guided by the uh, official uh, uh, definition, wala po tayong uh, official definition ng middle class. Uh, what we are doing is uh, we're looking at the poor uh, families and the uh, non-poor and in between that uh, we are uh, we can compute for example how many are in the upper uh, uh, below the 30 percent level but in terms of whether who are the middle class unfortunately we don't have such an official definition so you're just guided by the deciles the 10 deciles parang ganon. yes yes uh, but that's a whole uh, that's a whole that's a whole big c 
That's like saying uh, we'll survey the whole Pacific Ocean, di ba? And you say there's only poor and non-poor. Uh, Sir Carl, is there no better way of uh, targeting uh, and uh, classifying our families, uh, Sir Carl? Uh, we, we have many ideas, Mr. Chair, but uh, <laughs> apart from the official ones, uh, those are not uh, officially used. But uh, for the SAP, because I was involved in that uh, preparation, we, we, we basically cut it off where they are minimum wage and below as low income, and that is 18 million, uh, because we felt that they had no other social protection they have no paid sick leaves or whatever, or SSS. Can I clarify, Sir Carl? Yung 18 million are all below minimum wage. Uh, well, around the minimum wage and below. Because, uh, Mr. Chair, may hirap okay. po. Because it's in okay. It's okay. Minimum okay. Wages, sense of, uh, yes. Yeah, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure it's not very exact at this stage. Yes, though, not but, exact, uh, yes. Uh, you're saying minimum wage hovering around the minimum wage and below you. Yes, million. yes, yes. Because the minimum wage is very low in some provinces and very high in Manila. So, mahirap iput at a certain amount, but around that po. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Chair. Please, please go ahead, Minority Leader. Yes. Uh, to be candid, uh, Carl, I'm a little confused on all, all of these classifications. Can we not have a simpler classification with some qualification so that instead of saying uh, low income, poor, non-poor, uh, near poor, uh, it's so difficult to absorb all of this and craft policies that could address specific sectors. What's wrong with, you, you know, all right, uh, in the uh, uh, surveys done by uh, uh, the private, uh, by, by uh, let's say SWS and uh, uh, Pulse Asia, they say economic class A, B, C, D, E. Huh? Uh, I don't know. So they have that classification. Uh, we're used to that. Uh, why can we not come up with a uh, more uh, precise definition subject to qualifications? Um, similar to what the surveyors uh, would, would, would do. Is that possible? Rather than have all of this low income, poor, non poor, near poor, etc., etc. Uh, Mr. Chair, that's possible. In fact, I'll discuss it in the next FILSIS board meeting. Uh, but just to answer, Yung SWS kasi is uh, self reported. And then yeah. the, no, no, no. the no. market surveys ABCDE is also based on their own evaluation of your physical uh, characteristics. Yeah. Fine, fine. But at least there is, we understand the basis for all its limitations. Uh, but uh, we, with all its limitations, my problem is, in so far as government figures are concerned, you know, for the past 15 minutes, I have heard so many classifications: low income, poor, non-poor, near poor. <laughs> it's extremely difficult. And then I read. Uh, 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 public or uh, partially studies of PIDS saying that uh, the number of poor would rise by 5.5 million. I no longer know what what is this. Are these the new poor? Or are this uh, you know what what are these? So my 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 my, my thinking is I joined the um, uh, statements of uh, Senator Angara. Let's have a more understandable classification. Eh, hindi naman kami statistician lahat sa kongreso eh. Uh, so, eh, magkakamati kami sa policy thrust kung hindi naman naintindihan yung, yung data. So, can, again, we request that you review this, have a more definite classification. You have so many classifications. You can have some, some qualifications. But just as a general rule, uh, let us have uh, a more definite classification. Uh, a classification of our socio-economic classes. Yeah, before Mr. before Chair, Secretary we'll Carl responds, uh, and I see our Vice Chair Aimee, Yusuf Rose, and uh, Ma'am Sel also raising their hands. I will give you time, but I, I just like to kind of synthesize the discussion by saying we're just looking for better tools to understand the universe so that we can respond better. That's that's the main goal, no? uh, Sec Carl. Go ahead. Yes, we, we, we understand. We, we will do that. Uh, yeah, if I may ask the two lady experts if they want to, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll ask uh, we'll ask yeah. Mr. Marcos to put in because he's also the chair of economic affairs. So we we value your input. So. 
Thank you very much, Secretary Khan and my chairman, the minority leader. Uh, may I add to the confusion by saying that the DSWD uh, also has a list of Hanan, which yes. once again does not recognize the PSA headings nor the PIDs headings and uh, is based instead on proxy means, FIES, and so on. And uh, in addition, the NGUs under the ILG have a whole other group of headings under the community-based monitoring system. So napakagulo talaga. I've had a long-standing advocacy um, in poverty reduction, and uh, there's no disaggregated data on a regional or even provincial level. You can't focus on high-risk uh, climate-challenged uh, areas. Angulo talaga, sobra. So this would be a uh, big help if we can finally um, make our way through this forest of uh, data from uh, NEDA, from uh, uh, DSWD, and uh, even the ALG and the LGUs. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, Ch Madam Vice Chair, and uh, also the Chair of Economic Affairs, and also a three-term governor and three-term representative, so she knows of... Uh, what she speaks. I was about to actually talk about the, but I don't want to add the discussion. But dagdag na lang natin. May binanggit na nine million listahanan family si Yusek Mapa. May binanggit na sixteen million listahanan families again. So you know, it's growing and it's growing, and as it grows, the confusion is growing. So, and I think again, Vice Chair Amy alluded to something very important: is the disjoint between the local and the national governments. We have these tools and we don't know if we are maximizing it. I was actually going to bring it up a bit later, but maybe I'll throw it in now. In terms of health facilities, because health is a, is a, is a localized or it's, it's been given to the local governments under the LGC. But one of the reasons why uh, we had a bit of a disjointed response, uh, for lack of a better word, is because the DOH didn't have boots on the ground. They didn't have boots on the ground. The boots on the ground were belonged to the local governments, the BHWs, the municipal health officers, and they were not beholden or they were not answerable to the DOH secretary. Kaya hindi niya mamanduhan. Kaya yung contact tracing natin nasa DILG. So th these are some things we have to study very carefully. But in the context, um, maybe someone, if you have a local government expert, Carl, Sec Carl, you can look at all of these powers which have been given to the national, given to the local governments. But really, there are still substantial resources which are being dispensed by the national government. Like still, despite it being a localized uh, power, uh, it's still one of the biggest budgets. It's still one of the top five or six biggest budgets uh, of the government, though. So that's something we have to reckon with. And maybe something, some things fall within the cracks. Eh, yung mayayaman gumagandang health systems. Pero yung mga maliliit, the poorer, the third class, fourth class municipalities, hindi umaasen so yung kanilang mga health systems. So I'll, 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 I'll talk more about that later. But I want to ask uh, the thoughts of Yusek Edilion and Mam Celia uh, first. Yusek uh, Rose, Mam, you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So just to, uh, just to say that we that we hear you. In fact. Uh, um, for our research agenda for next year, so NEDA will actually be undertaking this this study on uh, you know classifying even the non-poor. Uh, we're also interested in uh, you know finding out. Simplifying, ma'am, ma'am Rose. That's right. Simplifying. Yes. Baka yung study nyo kasi maging mas maging complex yung yung pagsubok. At chikay tutuloy-tuloy namin all the way to you know the PSA board, mga ganong ganong klase ng ano you know to make it official. Actually, back in siguro mga twenty-five years. Sorry, sorry to keep interrupting, but tama si Amy na let's disaggregate the data because when you have macro yes. data, it papers over the inequalities in various regions. Yes, yes, yes. Eh. Yung, yung yes. spatial inequalities. So yeah. I, I, that was my complaint when I was acting Labor Chairman, when Senate, Senator Frank was the uh, Senate mm -hmm. President. I was acting Labor Chairman and I was shocked to find that we don't have labor statistics at the provincial level. So how can you make proper interventions in terms of attracting industries, in terms of creating jobs, yeah. if you don't even know what you're trying to do or what you're trying to measure? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, we, yes, 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 we will do that. Actually, with respect to disaggregating the data to the provincial level, we can do that now because uh, PSA has actually increased the sample size. So, naging times uh, four na siya. 
Uh, and then uh, as I was uh, saying earlier, more 25 years ago, actually, I did a study with Dr. Joseph Yap on uh, defining the middle class, uh, but that was a long time ago. And so we will revisit the study and uh, uh, update it. And like I said, kasi yun, study lang ulit to. Uh, so ang gagawin namin is uh, try to make it official so that uh, we can have, you know, just one classification nga na gagamitin, at least ng government. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, what sample size of four are you talking about? What's that? What does that mean? Hundred. Ada, uh, dati kasi mga nasa forty-three thousand, forty-two thousand lang for for the entire country. So that is only good for a regional disaggregation. Now we have one hundred and forty-five thousand. It's small area, no. You, you really have to go granular. It's not everywhere, in a, chair. Yeah, in an archipelago, you cannot have accurate uh, uh, depictions yes, yes. actually because uh, mm -hmm. it, it won't work for us. Yeah. because we're so we're so scattered. Eh. So that's you right, that's smaller right. samples at some point, no, we will we'll help yeah. you there. Yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Are you done, Yusek? I'll recognize. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I'm done, Yusek. Yusek, I'm done, Yusek. Yusek, Rose, nabanggit ninyo si Joseph Yap, panahon pa ng tatay ko, pwede ba? Nabutan ko yan, nabutan ko yan. Nabutan ko yan, nabutan ko yan. Nabutan ko yan, nabutan ko yan. We will revisit it. Yeah, uh, Director Celia. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I'd just like to mention that PIDS released a study this year, um, primarily uh, coming up with these groups. So in addition to the poor, we've, re we've classified the non-poor into six groups. So you have what you call the low income but not poor, the lower middle income, um, the middle um, middle class and then the upper middle income and upper income and rich. So I think it's a little bit more, we will probably come up with more, uh, ano ba, mas, mas madaling maintindihan na grouping na names, but basically the intent is really to um, be able to disaggregate the non-poor. So when you have interventions, uh, you can right. um, target it more. Can I, can I, Get a little more info about that. You're because the poor, according to what we've heard so far, is three million, and the near poor is 0.8 million. So that's 3.8, but the total is 26 million families. So you're talking another kind of 22.2 million families. And how yes. would you break that down in your six classes? Because that yun, um, they would constitute uh -oh. the non-poor, kumbaga, eh, non-year poor. Yeah. So so for the low income but not poor, it's about 8.4 million. Uh, which is, uh, and we've classified that as those yun, um, eight eight point four million. Okay, and what are the metrics there? What are the incomes? What are the the, per, the, the income would be uh, between uh, ten thousand. The monthly family income is between ten thousand nine hundred fifty seven to twenty one thousand nine hundred fourteen per month for a family of five. Ten thousand um, to one hundred fifty seven thousand. Uh oh. -uh. To, to 21,900. 21,900. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's the second? And, and the that second was, is... That the was second, lower income, not poor. Uh -oh. The second is the lower middle income. The, the monthly family income would range from uh, 21,914 to 43,828. And that and would... You would have about 7.6 million families. Okay. okay. And then for the middle middle class, um, the income would be from forty three thousand eight hundred twenty eight to seventy six thousand six hundred ninety nine, and you would have three point one million families. Okay. And then the next category would be the upper middle okay. income, and the range of the family income would be from seventy six thousand six hundred ninety nine to one hundred thirty one thousand four hundred eighty four. And okay. you would have about 1.2 million families. Okay. And then the upper income, but not rich, uh, the income would be 131,483 to 219,140. And okay. you would have about 358,000 families. Okay. And then the rich, um, at least 219,140 um monthly income um you would have about 143000 families 143000 yeah and the total of these uh, millions is uh, 22. close 2. to uh 
it's a little bit less than 26. Uh, I think that 26 million would pertain to the more recent estimates, but I think this one, this is for 2018. The numbers pertain to 2018. I think it's about 20. Actually, sumobra, may overlap. 24.6. I have around 24.6. I have around 24.75 uh, million. Yeah. Uh, as opposed to the 22 million that we know, uh, could you could you try to make sense of that without uh, confusing us further, ma'am? You, yeah. you can you? Because your your figures is 24 point about 24.75 million families, and yung binanggit ni Sec Carl, ang between poor and near poor is 22.2, .2, taking out the 3.8 poor and near poor. So try to reconcile it so that we can have only one. Pagka kasha sa isang band paper, ma'am, para maintindihan okay. po natin. <laughs> yeah, Sir Carl. Yeah, I see you raising your hand. Sir Carl. Mr. You're Chair. on mute. You're on mute, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, what I think is the main concern, uh, Mr. Chair, is we do not have an official definition of all this. Kaya when we have certain programs and research, iba iba. So what I will do, I will discuss in the PSIS, uh, sorry, in the PSA board. Uh, all this to, to come to see if we can come up with something official. So moving forward, uh, that definition will be uh, consistent. Kahit hindi pa siya official, at least we have some idea of making sense of the universe, like Carl. I think that's that's that's. Uh, uh, I, I think, think we can one, uh, yeah. the the once we transpose, from... we can use these speeds. At least it will be useful in terms of analyzing development in provinces. It's relevant to Balik Provincia. It's relevant to our uh, our health programs. It's relevant yes, to our poverty uh, programs. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I, I think I know Mr. that. Mr. Chair, the agriculture is not evolved. Exactly, and it's still one of the biggest budgets. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think I know the difference uh, in Celia's presentation. She's well, man, she number to... one, definitely, it's a number one. May overlap, right? It's 8.4 million. Yes, uh, and she's referring to households. Uh, I'm referring to families. So if I, oh, 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 yeah, that adds to the confusion. Yes. So how we, we will fix, we will fix that, can, yes. you, can you help us without uh, spending yes. the whole afternoon here <laughs> yeah. staring we, at you? We will, we will come back with a more formal, once we have discussed in the board, how we can uh, define okay. officially this. Uh, yeah. So can we leave this topic? Uh, I mean, do you want to say anything? I want it, it's, it's just one topic of many topics. Eh? So I want to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, check any thoughts on public transport at the moment, uh, where we are, where we're headed. Um, Mr. Chair, presently, uh, the economic development cluster of cabinet supports the gradual reopening of the public transport. No, no, I don't, I'm not talking the short term. I leave that to you guys. I'm talking about okay. the medium and long term. Oh. Well, uh, th there are transport master plans. I'll just check uh, whether we, we have completed these master plans, uh, especially for the NCR areas. Uh, that, that will spell where the needs are, uh, are required. Oh. Hindi lang sa NCR sec, even Metro Cebu, which is terrific uh, traffic, yes, Metro Iloilo, then, Metro Cagayan yeah. de Oro. Yes, really, um, really, uh, it's, I see these problems replicating themselves and uh, in the next decade, no? So can we, can you get back to us on that? Yeah, yes, definitely. And then any help that we can provide. Uh, so, so we talked a little bit about the jobs and poverty. Uh, how about uh, um, telco infrastructure? Are you, are you taking a look? Yes, who's that? Ah, Can Senator Nancy. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Senator Nancy. Yeah, kasi nabanggit mo lang yung tungkol dun sa transportation. Can we just get a status dun sa mga BRT programs? So okay, for sure. example, dun sa Cebu, uh, I think we're already paying for it. Eh, hanggang ngayon, ni, wala atang nangyayari dun. Pero tuloy-tuloy yung bayad natin. Dahil I kasi nag-aaway ang mga politiko dun. <laughs> part ng OWA. And then dito naman sa... NCR, pero hindi na nag-aaway. Wala na si, wala na si Tommy Osmeña. <laughs> yeah, sa mas dito naman sa NCR, sa EDSA, parang on their own, DOTR and M MMDA is implementing some kind of B BRT. Pero kasi di ba may pending din sa NEDA na BRT for EDSA na I don't know kung na-approve siya or kung ano na yung status niya ngayon. Maybe let's ask, no? but I think baka mas may alam dyan DOTR and MMDA. But let's ask NEDA if they know anything about it. Uh, Sec Carl, do you know anything about that? BRT, etc. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, um, the staff reported that it did not uh, go through. So th that is where we are now. The Which one? one? Yusa Cebu? The, did not no, go the, the EDSA. Ah, the EDSA. The Cebu, Cebu is ongoing. Ongoing, okay. 
Ongoing daw, Senator Nancy. Yung kuyong sa EDSA was not approved, pero meron tayo ngayong some kind of BRT na ini-implement ngayon ng DOTR. Uh, And in um, fact, parang they have already, parang they plan to spend already for that uh, BRT project. Uh, Ma'am, uh, it did not even go through the NEDA process, so we had no chance of approving or disapproving. I think it was a discussion with the implementing agency and the ADB uh, that it was not at that time um, uh, uh, feasible. So wala pong demand sa NEDA on that, on the EDSA. So, Mr. Chair, yung ongoing project ngayon along EDSA, walang ano yan, walang study coming from NEDA? Uh, which, which study? Uh, sorry, which project in NEDA? The, yung BRT ngayon, yung, yung bus system ngayon sa EDSA na ini-implement. Uh, the one, the, the COVID one, the one for COVID. Oh, pero parang uh, hindi na siya uh, pang COVID lang eh. Uh, well, uh, the NEDA, not NEDA, the DOTR did, did their own study and implemented it as a measure to speed up po yung turnaround po ng buses. Kasi uh, since 50% lang yung capacity, hindi po kikita unless may faster turnaround. And that is what is being used now. So, ang ibig sabihin ba neto, si Carl, pagkatapos, well, pag natapos itong problema sa COVID, babalik na ulit sila dun sa kabilang side of EDSA? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, ma'am. Pero I think uh, it's worth, ano, uh, it's worth uh, having that, that set up. I think they, they should um, consider extending it. Sige, siguro, Mr. Chair, baka sa budget na lang ng DOTR. Pero kasi they're calling it BRT project. Eh. If it's a BRT project, dapat dumaan to sa NEDA. That's just a temporary arrangement. They just hire uh, buses uh, and whoever wants to service. Yun na yun eh. I don't think it's a major undertaking. Temporary lang talaga. Band-aid lang talaga yan. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other questions, uh, Senator Nancy? I saw Majority Leader Zubiri I'd like to acknowledge him also. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair? Yeah. Um, oh. Siguro, since I already have the floor. Um, hihingi lang ako ng uh, uh, update dun sa population control program natin kasi, um, in fact, during uh, our session last week, nasa floor yung problema natin sa teenage pregnancy. How how are we addressing this problem? May may I request Yusek GP of the Popcom? Yeah, go ahead, Yusek. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Senator. Um, uh, we are addressing it. Uh, uh, we have been addressing it ever since uh, we started implementing the RPRH law. Very early on, at the start of the RPRH law in 2013. Um, we had already, PSA had already tagged teen pregnancy as increasing. Now, ever since the RPRH law has been implemented from 2013 up to uh, 2018, when we have the data, teen pregnancy among minors that is below 18 years old has been increasing. In 2018, we had 62,000 minors who gave birth. This is for uh, uh, civil registry data. So despite uh, the presence of the RPRH law, we have seen an increase in minors giving birth. So uh, what we have been pursuing is uh, working with the DepEd and DOH and DSWD, because these are major agencies that can contribute to uh, reducing adolescent birds in the country and uh, DepEd, however, was only able to come up with uh, uh, guidelines for comprehensive sexuality education in uh, 2018. And uh, it's only going to be probably next month in October when DepEd will start implementing comprehensive sexuality education in schools. Now the RPRH law, talks about comprehensive sexuality education, but it is really public school-based. Um, uh, in the pending bills before 
the Senate and uh, also in uh, the lower house, um, comprehensive sexuality education can be should be extended up to the community, to the out of school, and uh, also somehow link it, link comprehensive sexuality education to services being provided. The Supreme Court in 2014 ruled that uh, minors, even if they are already mothers or they are pregnant, cannot access family planning services without the consent of their parents. So they have difficulty accessing services and we believe that has contributed to the increasing number of uh, adolescent births, particularly among those below 18. And they are now, per study of UNFPA, uh, they are vulnerable if they did not finish school, uh, their, wa their wage income in their lifetime is about one fourth <clears throat> of someone who has completed school. So uh, under the Human Development Poverty Reduction Cluster, um, Secretary Bautista and Secretary Nograles have come up, have asked us to come up with a roadmap to address teen pregnancy and uh, DepEd, PAPCOM, and DOH are working on this roadmap. And at the core of that will be implementing comprehensive sexuality education. But we hope that the new bill, if it comes uh, out, will be able also to address comprehensive sexuality education also outside the school and to link this uh, education to services. Right now, we're able to do it, uh, and we have seen a partial reduction uh, of uh, adolescent births. But per PSA data, still 11% of all births in the country are happening among uh, girls, women below 20 years old. That percentage has not changed in the last few years. So uh, it is still a major problem. We have 60,000 minors starting families every year. They're vulnerable to economic, uh, social pressures, and they should be considered a vulnerable group. And, I, and we hope that the Senate, through this bill, will be able to address these uh, current issues and help the executive expand uh, the reach of uh, 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 prevention of adolescent pregnancy beyond what is now allowed by the RPRH law. Thank you, Mr. Director. Yeah, with the permission of Senator Binay, is it okay with Senator Nancy? Yes, I just interject. Go ahead. So, yeah, thank you. That's why yesterday, uh, Yusek, no, I mentioned that it is very important that we pa pass already, and I'm glad that uh, Secretary Carl uh, was here because he can help us uh, with the prioritization of these measures. The raising of the statutory rape age. The statutory rape age of our country is 12 years old. We are only one out of two countries. The next one is Ghana, I think, in Africa, of a 12-year-old statutory rape age. In other words, anyone of you or anyone who's an adult can have sex with a 14-year-old and 13-year-old and get away with it. In other countries, like the United States, that's called jailbait because automatic, if you have sex with a minor, you can uh, be filed with a statutory rape. And so that will help at least prevent uh, uh, these incidences from happening. You know? So we're pushing in the Senate to raise the, the minimum age. You know? The debate is whether it is 16 or, or 18. But uh, we're definitely going to try to push the minimum age to uh, no less than 16 years old. Uh, what do you say about, what can you say about that, uh, Yusek? Are you supportive of that yeah. measure? Um, uh uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator, we support that move. Actually, we have been noting that uh, the number of uh, pregnancies among 10 to 14-year-old children has actually gone up to 2,200 uh, in 2018. And uh, it has been it's the one figure that has been increasing. Uh, it was 1,000 in 2007. It's now more than double that from 20, 2007 in about 10 years. The number of 10 to 14-year-old 
adolescents giving birth has really gone up. And we have roughly around 40 to 50 10-year-old children giving birth every year. Do you, do you have a register of this, uh, Yusek? Do you have names and, and faces rather than just statistics? We have the numbers, uh, Mr. Chair, but uh, of course, this is coming from civil registry uh, from the PSA. Uh, so the names no, are not there, but... Uh, there is no effort have... to correlate with the... First, obviously, they will need the help, diba? Right? As to how to raise these children. Because uh, especially if they're unmarried and they're single, that's a, that's a societal problem. So is there any effort to deal with that? Yes, well, we have also noted, Mr. Chair, that... Uh, Many of these pregnancies among the 10 to 17-year-old uh, girls in particular, their, their partners are older than them. No? About 90% uh, uh, have partners that are older than them. So there's an element of uh, you know, uh, power play, of uh, exploitation here, uh, because it's older men who are uh, you know, the partners of these young Young, uh, precisely, older. precisely. Senator, you said, Senator Zubiri is familiar with that phenomenon. Uh, <laughs> uh, you said, no. yes, we said, that's why we <laughs> ako, ako the younger, champion, younger ako women champion ito, eh. uh, chairman, ako yung, ako yung champion ito to avoid uh, our single uh, uh, or, or predators. No, we have to stop these predators. From I have a 12 year old daughter, you know, so uh, and I know Sunny also as a daughter. Uh, and, and how old is your daughter, chair? chairman? Dapat ata hindi tama yung term na partner, mas bagay yung predator. Predator okay. talaga yeah, yan. In other countries, you say, ah, in other countries, regardless, yeah. if we, regardless of the love angle, ah, it's still statutory rape. No matter what. Yes, Mr. Chair. The proposal of Senator Zubiri to bring up the age of consent to 16 or 18 would uh, at least be, a, be uh, you know, um, a barrier or be a... Uh, might uh, scare off these predators. We are also we also proposed to the committee that uh, came up with the teen pregnancy bill to consider all minors who are giving birth as vulnerable po a vulnerable population and give them social protection, like uh, much like we do for senior citizens, for um, people with disabilities until probably the age of twenty five. Because the study from UNFPA shows that if you are a minor parent, it's likely you will not complete high school and you will have lower wages because of your non-completion of school. Hindi ba sila sa CCT? Time, Are they not part um, of the CCT? Actually, Mr. Chair, what's happening is uh, DSWD has noted a higher number, an increasing number of adolescent uh, children of the CCT household heads who become pregnant. I think it's now the number four reason for them to drop out. So what actually happens is uh, these children are removed from the CCT uh, because they drop out of school. And it's a condition that they have to stay in school. If they drop out of school because of pregnancy, then they become even more vulnerable. That's why we ask for... Then they should, they should be exempted from that condition, di ba? Kung ganon. Kasi temporary yeah. stage lang naman ang pregnancy eh. But the poverty will subsist and the need for education will subsist. Yes, we have been discussing this matter with DSWD, Mr. Chair. There's a National Advisory Committee that has taken note of this. And we hope to continue to work with uh, them on that. And uh, actually what we're proposing is once you are an adolescent with your own family, you should now be a different household and be given the full support um, and of the CCT program because you are yourself now a head of a family, even if you are a minor and most of the time you don't have a, a, a husband. Can you give us a written Thank report you. on this, uh, Yusek? Uh, yung conclusions nyo about, uh, yung findings nyo about the number of unwed uh, mothers, minor unwed mothers, Etc. and your suggested interventions, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We Siguro will. Just to add, yeah, yung, go ahead, go ahead. I'll give, it, I'll give the floor back to Yusek, uh, uh, to Senator Bina and to Majority Leader Migs. So. Yusek, Teres, yung sinasabi niyo ba ang figures? Part ba yan ng isang comprehensive study on teenage pregnancy? 
CRVS. Well, this is a review of the CRVS data, which PSA comes out with. And the latest information that they have come out is uh, a 2018 uh, civil registry report from which uh, I derived the 62,000 minors who gave birth uh, below 18 years old in 2018. In 2017, it was 60,000. Um, Mr. Madam Secretary. Yes, Mr. Secretary. Pero wala pa ho tayong talagang comprehensive study that will um, discuss itong phenomenon on teenage pregnancy. Like, siguro yung demographics, ano ba talaga yung reasons behind uh, teenage pregnancy, uh, Ano ba yan? Particular ba yan sa isang uh, area in the Philippines or may, may wala pang ganon? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Senator, we have uh, the Young Adult Fertility Survey. Uh, it was last conducted in 2013 and that covers all regions. And that is where we noted uh, a doubling in, in terms of uh, premarital sex happening among uh, young adults, particularly 15 to 19, from 20% uh, having had premarital sex, it went up to 31% in 10 years, from 2003 to 2013. So that is the major so study. From 2013 to 2020, yeah. yes, to we, to then. Um, we are, I think uh, it's planned for next year, the next uh, uh, but it's also come out in the National Demographic Health Survey. There are, uh, you know, uh, correlating in data in the 2017 Demographic Health Survey. We can also provide you that. There is a study also made by UNFPA on, uh, this is on the income, uh, the economic uh, effects of uh, teen pregnancy in the country, which is around 33 billion pesos annually lost to young girls uh, because they were not able to finish school. This is among just the adolescent uh, mothers, no? yung mga batang ina. And most recently, there's a study that's come out from UP Population Institute, which covers, which projects the impact of uh, COVID on uh, pregnancy, maternal health, and adolescents. Uh, and they project that there will be a higher number of uh, adult uh, pregnancies as well as teen pregnancies um, due to the impact of COVID. And we can uh, provide you with all those studies uh, as part of our submission uh, to the committee. At least we can give you the links uh, to those studies, uh, Madam Senator. Okay. Mr. Paris, actually, yung yung tatanong ko eh, kasi di ba parang may ano na, dahil sa COVID, dahil sa lockdown, uh, ang projection nila by next year is another population explosion. Boom. Population boom. <laughs> population yeah, boom, di ba? Walang ginagawa ang mga yeah. tao. Nawala pa yung EBS na pwede nilang panoorin. So talagang wala na silang ginagawa sa bahay nila, di ba? Yes. Senator Nancy at saka uh, Apo Chair, uh, I would like ko also to add uh, sa sinabi ni Yusek Perez na yung World Bank Report of October 2019 is very, very enlightening as it uh, actually uh, cited two social problems that have tremendous economic impact. Yung isa doon, sinight nga yung Philippines sa teenage pregnancy. Yung ikalawa, yung childhood stunting. Dahil uh, yung ating statistics dyan, comparable to Africa. So, I think, uh, ishishare ko na lang yun. Kasi galing sa World Bank yun, ang liwaliwanag doon eh. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, uh, Madam Chair. Yun lang, Madam yeah, Madam. Chair, and uh, we'll just wait Thank for you. the submissions. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yes. uh, remind uh, na lang, Yusek, yes. huh? submission. But yes, don't, yes. Just, don't just give us the studies. Sana you synthesize the findings also for us to make it easier, no? Yung, ano yung yes, crucial? Yes, yes, yes. What are the top uh, problems more, most urgent for you? Majority Leader, would you yes, like to yes, ask yes. Uh, some Mr. questions? Chair, Mr. Chair, siguro last na lang. Um, ano ba talaga projection niya for next year in terms of population growth? Well, uh, UP Population Institute has projected uh, at least 240,000 additional births on the on top of the 1.6, 1.7 million births that occur every year. If that uh, comes so to, to pass, 
we will have 2 million births at least next year because of the impact of COVID. And that will, mean, that will actually be the highest number of live births in the country. The, last, the highest we had was 1.77 million in 2012 before the RPRH law. That was the highest number of live births recorded by PSA. From that number, it's been uh, between 1.6 uh, and 1.7. It's been gradually decreasing, uh, but uh, because of COVID, we might reach the peak or the highest number next year. And may may niyo hubay yung projected two million kung ilang don yung middle class, poor, near poor. Uh, unfortunately, Madam Senator, the study does not allow that, but we can probably uh, use uh, the number cited by PIDS, by PIDS, uh, you know, to to correlate it with uh, those. Uh, but, but generally, uh, Madam Senator, it is uh, the lowest 20 to 40 percent of the population that have the largest family, larger family sizes. So I would presume uh, the 20, lowest 20 percent would have a disproportionately large uh, number of those uh, births next year, Madam Chair. Ah, Madam yes, Senator. Yes, she's like, yun nga the irony of things. Yung mga mayayaman, nagbabayad ng million-million through surrogate or through in vitro just to have kids. Tapos yung mga kababayan naman natin na kung tutusin talagang hirap to raise a family, sila naman ito parang ang bilis-bilis nilang uh, uh, manganak at magpadami. Yun lang po, Mr. Yes, Chair. Sir. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Senator. Thank you, Senator Nancy. You, have, you can use it in your next book. Uh, on you can make teenage pregnancy your, uh, your, your one of your topics. <laughs> yeah, read aloud to children. <laughs> A majority leader. Uh, you're, yes, thank you. You're on mute, Nancy. You're on mute. Thank you. You're on mute. You're on mute. Uh -huh. How to avoid ano, teenage pregnancy. pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> majority leader, yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you know, it's a big advocacy of mine. I'm thankful that uh, USEC uh, Paris is there because um, um, it really disgusts me, you know, and it's so disturbing the number of teenage pregnancies uh, that are, are going on in our country. It's triple-digit increase. Huh? It's not a single or double. It's a triple-digit increase, hundredfolds yung increase ng every year of teenage pregnancies. And... Uh, um, it shows, I'm sad because it really shows our society today. No? Uh, parang they allow it pa. It becomes such a macho thing. Where in other countries, it's unheard of. Uh, in a decent uh, civilized country, it is unheard of. And uh, dealt with tremendously. These predators, if you, as I'm sure the chairman would know, that these predators are marked for life. When they are actually released from prison, wherever they go, the, the, yeah. the communities notice that this fellow was a predator. He's either yeah. a pedophile or a, yeah, basically they're pedophiles. If you're caught with statutory rape, that's a pedophile, you're, you're a pedophile. So uh, they are marked for life. Dito sa atin, parang baliwala lang. Badge of honor pa in certain areas. So uh, I think uh, we have to stop that practice and... Uh, um, I'm, I'm seeking the support, and I'm so happy that the, my colleagues have supported us in this measure. We're just waiting for the um, hopefully committee report, and we'll be able to get this out uh, as soon as possible time. Um, my questions, Mr. Chairman, would not be with uh, Popcom anymore, but I thank you for his full support. And we we ask your help, uh, USEC, up pag uh, pinaglaban po natin ito. Sana maging priority yes. measure than administration. We'll come up with uh, supportive statistics. Uh... Yes. Mr. Senator. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I need those statistics, USEC, because uh, during the uh, period of sponsorship, uh, lalabas at lalabas natin yan, and I'm sure we'll be interviewed uh, about it. We have to show the people the alarming rate of what's going on now in our country, especially in the countryside. Thank, Thank you, you, USEC. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, this question, Siguro, am I, uh, can I ask questions already or, or, my, uh, or are there other colleagues yeah. pending? Yeah, no, no. So you, you, can, you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Just the chair. Yeah, mine is lang kay uh, uh, Neda Chair uh, Carl. Carl, uh, good to see you again. Uh, although we did recommend you for uh, 
uh, feel health, but that's okay. We we're happy that you're still in bed. <laughs> <laughs> I know we gave you sleepless nights, but that was more of a compliment, Secretary. You know, Chairman, that was more a compliment. That means we know you are an action oriented person and you are clean to the bone so integrity is integrity your integrity is unquestionable so be flattered when we when we actually uh uh um you know um give our endorsement of you but uh, the questions that i'll ask uh, uh sec is basically on the build 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 programs what are kasi parang lumalabas parang start 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 pa lang tayo eh two years na lang na iwan kay presidente di ba so, ang tawag dyan, hindi na build, build, build. Start, start, start. When do we start, start, start? Unless... Gra ground break, already... ground break, ground break na lang. Ground oh, break, ground break. break, ground break. Ground... Oh, kasi wala pang ribbon cutting eh. Ground break na muna tayo. So, uh, may we just ask, what are on the pipeline for this sec? And I, and the reason why I raise this, because it's the flagship of the administration. So, uh, we are, I'm asking you this and not the DPWH, because the DPWH only has a certain amount of projects, di ba? Airports, DOTR, all the others are under NED. So <clears throat> may we know among the priority build, build, build projects of the president four years ago, uh, what are actually uh, what have actually started and are ongoing and are nearing completion? Maybe just a rough, uh, um, I'd say, uh, touch on this issue. No? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sir, my majority leader, I'll return the favor next time by recommending you. Uh, but if I, if I may... <laughs> Thank you. You can recommend me to your classmates and savior for my election. Okay. Re election. <laughs> 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 well, um, uh, let me clarify, Mr. Chair, that in the build, 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 there are many projects. Uh, there are very big ones, which we monitor as part of the flagship programs. And there are 104 of them. And there are also the medium and small ones, which are being implemented every year uh, through the budget process. And the mere fact that we have more than doubled the infrastructure program in the last four or five years to 1.12 trillion next year suggests that many of them are actually happening. Uh, but sometimes uh, maybe there are a few projects that are more delayed uh, that catches attention. In the 104, uh, when we did the revision, all of them are uh, either implementing or will begin next year, and they have a budget cover. Uh, of the 104 that we submitted to the uh, office of your office and the senators, actually uh, 44 are ongoing construction, and then 34 are in the pre-construction activities, meaning they have been approved and are being designed or detailed engineering or right of way or just waiting for uh, the actual start. Uh, two have actually been completed in the flagships and 24 are being processed for approval. So can, you actually, name, can you name some of the big ones? Uh, the, among uh, That's only 100 plus, so maybe you're saying, what was the first, what was the first uh, group that you... You mentioned these, how many were they? Well, the ongoing ones are 44. Ongoing what are the 44, uh, Carl? Say Carl. 44? Let me, let me just get my list because my memory is not great. So in the, in the flagships, the completed ones are the Luzon Bypass Infrastructure Project and the Angat Water Transmission Improvement Project. So those are the two completed. The ones ongoing are the, for instance, uh, New Clark City, the ICT Capability Development and Management Program, the National Broadband, North-South Commuter Railway, MRT hold on, 7, hold on. The North-South so Commuter Railway, let's, let's, go, let's go one by one. So... The North-South Commuter Railway is ongoing. That is the the one connecting the uh, Clark the, with Metro Manila in the south? Uh, yes, this is the North, PNR North. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. MRT 7, the Line 1 LRT extension to Cavite, the MRT 3 rehabilitation project, LRT 2 extension, the Bicol Airport, the LTO sa IT project, the Grand Central Station, the... Saan yung Grand Central Station, Carl? You said, as secretary. Where exactly? Where exactly? 
Uh, the that is the common station in the north end. Yes. 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 And then, uh, would you like me to continue all the list? It's a long. Yes. Yes. Please. Please. That's my clear. Lang naman yun. Forty-four lang. You mentioned the uh, seven. Okay. Like... Well, there's the Malang Airport in Central Mindanao, General Santos, Clark Airport, Southeast Metro Manila Expressway, the Skyway, uh, Davao Coastal Road Project, including a bridge. So that is the first 19. Then the Metro Cebu Express, the growth corridors in Mindanao, the NLEX SLEX connector. On the NLEX SLEX collector, how far are we in already? Uh, far? Well, uh, I'm. There are two connector maybe... roads, about one built by the MVP group and the other one built by San Miguel. Well, the, I think the other one is the Skyway extension. How okay. far are we? Do we have the. I, we will, we will, I will check how, exactly how far we are because every day there's a change in the progress. Okay. Uh, where where are we? Uh, then we have the Southern Luzon Expressway, C5 South Link Express, Camarines Sur, High Speed Highway, Pangil Bay Bridge, Bacolod Negros uh, Highway, the Integrated uh, DRR Climate Change Measures in the Low Lying Areas in Pampanga. Uh, maybe then, siguro, uh, sec, para to facilitate, no? maybe we can just, I asked kasi uh, last yes, Monday yes. during the DBCC, I asked for a copy of that. Were you yes. able to submit to my office? We, we submitted, yes. Uh, in fact, it's a link that you can actually click. It's uh, available in our website, the table. Okay. On, I'm, I'm also interested on the projects in Mindanao because if uh, we want to push for Mindanao's development. You yes. earlier mentioned uh, Mlang Airport. Um, in that is in North Cotabato, diba? We are also trying to build our airport in Bukidnon, the Bukidnon uh, Airport. Uh, is it uh, in the radar of NEDA as well? Have, we have not seen it yet. It has not been submitted yet for appraisal. Perhaps I think because the, the reason, the reason being, it's a multi-year, uh, multi-year allocation by the DOTR. So hindi na siguro nila pinaplay sa sa NEDA. That's probably the reason. If it is a locally funded project below a threshold, uh, yes, it might yes. not go through the NEDA ICC because uh, yeah. there are parang criteria to go through the NEDA ICC. What's the That's threshold, Sir Carl? 2.5 billion peso or if it is ODA or PPP or other factors, uh, okay. with government guarantees, for instance. Okay. But yung mga unsolicited, pro, un unsolicited uh, BOI, wala sa inyo yan, no? hindi tumadaan sa inyo. Unsolicited. Yeah. Oh, no, no, they, go, they go through. PPP, <laughs> unsolicited, they, they have to go through, yes. Uh, if it is LGU, then there is a threshold also. There are thresholds kasi po in the ICC. Uh, well, okay. Mr. Chair, yung Mindanao, uh, there are actually... Uh, how many in Mindanao? Um, how many in Mindanao? Do you have a summary table? Uh, Mindanao. Yung ating ano, sec, sa Visayas naman, yung one, I've, you know, yeah. since, since I um, ran in 2007, Mindanao I've been advocating 23, yeah. 23 projects. Yung sa Visayas kasi sec, uh, chairman, no? I've been, since 2007, that was my rallying cry when I ran first, my first term uh, in 2007. Yung uh, Visayas, one Visayas bridge program, which technically has been designed now by the DPWH, Connecting the islands of Negros with Iloilo through Guimaras, and then uh, uh, the uh, islands of uh, Cebu with Bohol, and then eventually Cebu uh, with Negros in the in the Negros Strait, no, uh, under near Dumaguete. Um, my anong anong um, ano ang ating uh, developments dun? Are there sections that are being implemented, or these are still all in the drawing board? Uh, the ones that are in the flagship, I understand, are several bridges, including the Panay Gimaras section, uh, Pangil Bay Bridge, and several smaller bridges. The other ones, kasi po, uh, they they have to be planned uh, still yes. because the flagship projects are focusing on the ones that can be implemented within the term, and they have to start actually next year for the remaining ones. Uh, the rest, kasi, um, uh, we will consider them if the plans are there. Yeah. 
Well, sana you can consider because uh, my, me, I'm actually originally from Negros, no, aside from Bukidnon. Mm. And uh, it makes it more feasible. The Panay Gimaras is more feasible if you add Negros. Because Gimaras is a smaller economy, no? no, no I know our minority leader is from Iloilo, and that's a very good bridge. But to make it to make it work, <laughs> to make it more valuable in terms of uh, transport of goods to and fro Panay Island to Negros, because Negros are, is a huge economy, as well as Panay Island. Gimaras okay. is only a conduit in between, no? But uh, of course, tourism, they have fantastic tourism, mango exports, etc. So it makes a big difference na matuloy din natin yung Gimaras Negros Connector Bridge. That makes it more viable. It's a more viable uh, economic uh, activity for the region. Diba? Kasi that will now connect the whole Region 6. Eh. That will now connect the whole Region 6. Ang, ang connection dyan will be Gimaras to, if not not mistaken, nandyan si Uncle Frank, uh, ano yan, dadaan sa San Carlos. San Carlos City of Northern Negros. Then Papaso. Uh, Mr. President, uh, Mr. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Minority Which Leader. Are... You, you, yeah. you, 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 to see beautiful Iloilo City. Dati nilalait nyo yan, di ba? Just as an input, uh, Mr. President, in fairness, uh, really, really it was a Panay Gimaras Negros bridge. And uh, funded initially, and uh, uh, initially, the uh, Chinese government was interested. However, the uh, magnitudes were uh, were large uh, the magnitude of the budget and the design was uh, four lane uh, so that it really it was really uh, a huge outlet in fact i raised the question now uh, is the uh, uh, feasibility study will support this kind of an expense they said yes uh, well and the, 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 uh, the majority leader is correct when you connect the two, you can justify the budget. But let me be candid with the majority leader. Unfortunately, the politicians in Negros, again, they know kung saan mag landing you. So, and I was telling them, look, if it's a technical um, decision, and, and you know, in fairness uh, to the regional director of, uh, of Region 6, the uh, 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 director of Anne Bacal, she was saying, you know, th this is a technical decision. But, uh, well, you know, uh, the, the politicians also have technical knowledge. So, <laughs> No, wala yung no wala yung negros uh, dimaras. What was the technical decision, minority leader? What was it? In San Carlos? Was that the technical recommendation? No, no, my apologies. My apologies. It's not San Carlos. It's Pulu Pandan. San Carlos is in the other side of the uh, island facing Cebu. But yeah, so that's uh, majority San leader, Pulu Pandan. Chairman, the majority leader will confirm that uh, the uh, political leaders of Negros could not, <laughs> did not agree on where the bridge will uh, will uh, will be located because it means also economic activity in fairness to them. But uh, because of that, uh, the, there was a delay in the decision. Hanggang, I think, the Chinese government realized the, the huge exposure, so said, all right, we will no longer fund that. But that's why earlier uh, uh, Secretary Carl Chua said, they are now talking to the Koreans for oh, the Panay Gimaras, which is right. of the smaller uh, exposure. I think. I what? heard the the Chinese said they said they will fund it if it will extend all the way to the West Philippine Sea. The <laughs> 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 uh, and yes, uh, <laughs> the politicians will not intervene. <laughs> but yes, um, you're absolutely correct. Um, now I recall, now I recall, especially since it's supposed to land in Pulu Pandan, now I recall uh, there might be some, uh, there were some local uh, uh, 
Is that Mayor Conflict. Peña? Conflict. Is that Mayor Peña? <laughs> Mayor Mix, kaibigan natin yan. No, Mayor Peña. Yeah, no, yeah. yeah. But other other towns, as the, as the good minority floor leader had said, other towns had also requested that it pass through there. So I, I will make a I'll manifest, I will talk to the provincial governor, see Governor Laxon, and see how far we are on this particular issue. They Obviously, they have to get their acts together so that uh, the feasibility study can be done, presented, and funded. Yes. So, um, okay, uh, Sir Carl, so... Uh, how about the other side? Are there any plans for the Cebu uh, uh, Bohol uh, section uh, passing through Olango uh, in northern Cebu? Wala pa. So, so far among the one bridge, one besides bridge program, ang, ang uh, ready for implementation is the Ilo Ilo Gimaras section. Yung iba wala pa. At least I, for my personal, but I can help you guys yeah. push down on the level with the, they, with the local governments. They are undergoing study, uh, Senator. So, the, you know, the NEDA is not the proponent. Eh? There are implementing agencies. Uh, once they're done with their uh, preparation, uh, they submit to NEDA for evaluation. So far, we have not seen them. So maybe I'll just talk to, probably I'll address that question to DPWH under SecMark. Yeah, most possibly. Yes, yes. All right. The reasons why I ask these questions really is so that we can really push for development down south, no, both Visayas and Mindanao, so that we can continuously push for the build, build, build. Or maski naman lang start, 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 no, Sunny? Start, start, start. <laughs> dig, 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 ground break, dig. ground break, ground break. <laughs> All right, so I don't have, don't have any further questions, uh, Mr. Chair. As you know, I have high high expectations and high hopes and uh, um, on the new Secretary of NEDA. Uh, I have uh, no doubt that he can steer the uh, agency to uh, great heights and uh, be able to help us achieve our, uh, at least to survive this pandemic and to uh, go back to normalcy. Right now, I cannot say higher levels because we are in a rut, no? But I, I know under the next two years with the supervision of uh, Carl Chua there, Secretary Chua and Neda, uh, being your co-schoolmate from Savior, I am a Severian father. I am a son, I have two sons there, and one of them happens to be the classmate of Sec Carl. So uh, I know we can achieve uh, back to normalcy and go back to our at least uh, high growth rate figures, uh, hopefully in the next two years. So thank you, Mr. Chair, and I wish the good Secretary good luck and uh, thank you. Godspeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. He's not forgiven you for recommending him to feel healthy. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, when I recommended him to feel help, Senator Gachalian was very adamant that he's the best guy for the job. He said he's the man of his dreams. <laughs> thank you, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Majority Leader. Anyway, uh, Sir Carl, going back to what I was uh, talking about before Senator Binay and Senator uh, Majority Leader Migs asked their questions. Could you, you, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a, I, I don't know if you've even had your lunch yet, but I'll just throw it out there and then maybe you can just come back to us. I know also you're very busy with the short term programs because of the COVID. So I'll give you time to sort of, uh, I don't want to rush you into these things. I just want to, basically what I want, Sec Carl, is uh, I want to know where we're headed in the next few decades, no? What's in the pipeline, what we have to prepare for. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, ito yun, no? yung public transport, you mentioned some of them in the list that you gave to the majority leader, the MRT, the LRT. Could you tell us all about that? Uh, not now, but uh, mm, okay. maybe in the near future, in the, in the next few weeks ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, public transport is one. Then uh, what are your plans with jobs and poverty, anti-poverty programs? Uh, maybe nga, according to Senator Aimi, there may be a need to kind of tweak and revisit like what you said, for instance, pagka nabubuntis pala, nawawala sa skwela. So nawawala rin pala sa CCT program. So that's kind of a, uh, uh, that, that's kind of a dysfunction or a aberration in the program. In fact, they're the ones who need it more, di ba? Mm -hmm. Kasi they, they, they'll be giving birth. So that's another addition or another condition that might, that might exacerbate their poverty. And another one is the state, how equipped are we to deal with the, uh, uh 21st century type of industries so what's the state of uh data science for instance mm -hmm. what's the state of our broadband what are the steps we're taking mm -hmm. uh and then 
in connection also with the Balik Provincia, I'd like to take a larger look at our rural development, uh, Sec. Carl. No? Uh, I, I asked you during the DBCC, and you've submitted it, but I, I haven't had a look yet because we've been busy having our hearings regarding the the laggards in terms of uh because nga after you know i was i was local government chair there's there's a lot of inequalities not only in individuals but also in political units no so uh how do we help do you have any programs in the works to help for instance the third to sixth class municipalities etc in terms of upgrading uh their capacities and even the poorer provinces no how do we get them up in terms of development and another one is the health infrastructure because uh when we tackled the medical scholarships bill which is already passed here in the senate uh we it, it tackled or it touched on larger uh needs of society and our country which is the need for more doctors the need for better rural health uh rural health uh access mm. in, in so is and then one of the things that I've heard is with the IATF is nahirapan talaga sila with this uh, disjointed system of health on the local and the national. So can you take a look at that? Not only in the health context, there's the larger context of uh, the, the, the powers that were uh, devolved, like health, um, agriculture, tapos ano yung plano natin sa, sa health? Like, uh, like I, I, I read that... Uh, you know the MVP group sold pala to the Singaporeans their hospitals. So it seems even the privates are having a problem. No, and that's not maybe that's not such a good sign. No, or 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 maybe it is a good sign that uh, there's there's foreign investment coming in. No, but uh, I guess if the privates are having a problem, what more the public health system? Or maybe there is a need to uh, place greater resources in our our public health hospitals no because we were we were really thinking of kind of uh, replicating the pgh up manila structure uh in the in the provinces we have a little bit of that already uh in certain places no but it must be rational it must be comprehensive so could you help us with that uh and then uh this is a bit of a laundry list uh you mentioned dar and new departments a while ago is there a, st a pending study on which departments have possibly can be merged or uh, uh, have can be phased out, for instance, and subsumed under without uh, with the minimum of loss of jobs, huh, given the current circumstances? Uh, so yun lang muna si Carl, and then maybe the next, the last one is our our cultural and soft power. I don't know if that's something on your radar, but uh, I think I think it's something where we might have a comparative advantage, no? That some countries have leveraged very well, no? But uh, they're uh, they're much older uh, countries in terms of their existence. They have much longer histories. But I'm just wondering if there's anything in the works for that. So so yun lang say Carl. No, I don't want to take up too much of your time today. Uh, this is a budget hearing. But please put those on your radar. Yeah. So any other questions from our uh, our members, uh, Vice Chair Imi? Any anything else from you, Madam? No more. Uh, Minority Leader. Anything else? Majority Leader Mix, no more. My no Majority Leader Jamie, I see you taking from the ref. <laughs> no more. So, Mr. Mr. Carl, Mr. anything Chair, else before uh, we suspend the hearing? Yeah. Yeah. Th thank you, Mr. Chair. You gave a very good list of uh, areas to study. Some actually have overlapped with my um, my request to the team. Uh, in fact. Uh, uh, some of these really pertains to how we rethink our development planning. Yung nakaraan kasi, we were possibly uh, just trying to get back to feet. No? Uh, and now we are approaching upper middle income country status. Kailangan talaga tingnan lahat itong mga issues that you raise. Otherwise, uh, we are growing, but our institutions and the people are not uh, as growing as fast as the economy or the macro economy. So certainly, uh, we will uh, take a look. In fact, we have started to look at some of them, um, but it, 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 it will require really a bit of work, uh, actually, because um, this is really thinking 20, 30 years down the road. Uh, we have the ambition that in 2040, I think we will start making sure that all of these uh, visions that we have are are starting to see operational results. Thank you. Are you are you monitoring or updating that ambition 2040? Uh, well, a... uh, the ambition 2040 is a vision. Eh? 
and our next few years of development plans are the ones that really implement or, or get us towards our vision. And Yusef Gross is that uh, expert there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So we will no, I was just going to I was just going to say that we were supposed to come up with a survey this year, but those were you know part of the funds that we had to give up. Okay. So we don't know yet if uh, uh, we will have the resources to do it next year. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Secretary. Members. I don't think our members have any other questions, so we thank you for uh, answering our questions patiently and presenting your budget, and we'll favorably endorse your budget to the plenary. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Carl, Yusek Rose, uh, Yusek uh, uh, Perez, etc., and the other uh, Yusek, Yusek Johnny, and all the other. Uh, uh, and thank you to our colleagues also, Majority Leader, Minority Leader, Vice Chair Aimee. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you, Sek Carl. Uh, salamat. Thank you very much. Thank you very much also. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.